Hello there. Welcome to TalkNet. Hi, sir. How you doing? Okay, kid. Well, my problem is I'm 17 years old, and uh, I'm going into the service in June. I'm going uh, for four years. Mm -hmm. It must be the Air Force or the Navy. Army. Four-year Army. I, I thought the Army was a three-year commitment. Well, they have two, three, or four-year uh, commitments, and I'm going in for four-year because I chose to be a medic for the Army. Oh. All right, so you see, there are certain career paths you got to go in for a longer period of time. Right. Well, yeah, they have certain programs with each each different career that you can choose, or each different oh. job you can choose. I see. Okay. So, anyway, right now uh, I have like six months before I leave, and I have a 17-year-old car that is not very reliable. And I'm graduating early. I'm graduating on the 13th of January this year, and I was hoping to do some traveling between uh, the time they're graduating before I go in. What kind of traveling? Well, I was thinking uh, cross country, um, go hey. out out west and visit my grandparents. How are you going to finance all that? Well, I'm I'm working uh, a job right now, and I'm going to be working full time then. And I was going to leave. I wasn't going to travel for the whole duration of the time, but just for like a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I'm I'm looking at getting a new car. I think you're foolish. Foolish, huh? Yep. Oh, should I get one? Well, see, because I was thinking about getting one before. I went to the service. Like, well, first of all, you may not be able to have a car in the service for a while. Right. For the be, first. Be, be much better off not to think about a new car. If you want to go visit your your grandparents, get on a plane. Okay. Well, what, what about, uh, I mean, just getting around town, too, the car's not the most reliable. Well, you only got six months. Nurse it. Okay. All right. And then the other thing is, how do I go about <laughs> setting up myself a credit line? Uh, well, you're, you're not going to get a credit line at 17 in all likelihood. Well, I... You know, yeah, but I'm turn, I turn 18 in, in January. Well, even at 18, you're not going to get a credit line in all likelihood. Okay. It takes a while. Got to have an income history and so forth. I mean, you're, I think you're trying to rush it a little bit, Tiger. Well, probably. I mean, I have no problem with the military and so forth, but you want to go visit your, your grandparents, get on an airplane or take a bus or a train. Right. I wouldn't spring for a car. You're not going to be allowed a car during basic training. Let's start with that. Right. And you may or may not get to an assignment where a car is a practical proposition. Right. Well, see, the reason that well, I was talking to my recruiter, and he told me that they would ship it anywhere around the world if I could just get it to one of the coasts if I got an overseas duty. Well, if you go, but that's a war. You're not going overseas for a while. Right. Well, it's going to be six months before I'd be able to have the car anyway. So do yourself a favor. Walk a little before you try to do the 100-yard dash. All right. I do wish you well, kid. Thanks a lot, Bruce. All right, guy. Good luck with the military. Burke, Virginia. Hello there. Hi, Bruce. Uh, Hi. Long time listener and admirer. And uh, in fact, I've got many miles walking around the block listening to your show at night. Well, I'm glad we can keep you company. Uh, what I'd like to talk to you about is uh, recently uh, I was reading in a financial magazine about a person who uh, sold their house uh, by essentially taking uh, a limited number of hundred dollar entries. Yeah. Uh, for, into an essay contest. I was going to say for writing or something. So these make great stories, but right. how often do you think they ever bring them off? Sure. Well, uh, I'm considering something, something similar, and that's what I want your opinion on. Uh, my wife and I have been collectors of uh, dolls and figurines uh, for about the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I've got about 100 uh, figurines, all of one, uh, one uh, company, so to speak. Like who? Uh, you know, like Yadro and Hummel and things of that nature. Hmm. Which company do you, you say you have a hundred from one company? I have a, I have a hundred. Uh, I'm in the cottage business. Uh, you've heard of uh, David Winter and uh, uh, Lily Put Lane, things along that nature. Hmm. Okay. I have about a hundred of which about 75 are retired. Uh, uh -huh. And I've put about uh, $3,500 into them. Uh, the market value, and, and granted, I realize that's a loose uh, Boy, it word. surely is when you come to collectible. Correct. Uh, they're only worth what somebody will buy them for. And exactly. I realize that. Uh, but market value on the secondary market, uh, they hit somewhere around $10,000. What I'm considering doing sometime here in the future is uh, placing some ads in some of the collectible magazines and newsletters and club newsletters and essentially looking at uh, raffling off uh, uh, my collection. Uh, you cannot $10. conduct a raffle. Say again? You may not conduct a raffle. Okay. It's illegal. A raffle is a game of chance, and only the ability to conduct raffles uh, or the, the license to conduct raffles in every jurisdiction that I'm aware of uh, is limited to nonprofit organizations and whatever. All right. Or in, in some cases, you know, casinos or whatever. But you can't have a raffle. All right. 
uh, is there a better term or word for it? Well, the, well, the word raffle is totally inappropriate. Sure. Uh, you, you'll notice when you when we when you open the conversation, you said uh, that people had to write an essay, right? Right. Well, that's a contest, isn't okay. it? Okay. But I think that that's the that this this is uh, all that cutesy stuff, and it makes it's the kind of thing that it makes good magazine articles, sure. but not very good business. Caught my attention. Yeah, but as I say, it, it, they're good magazine articles, yeah. but but they are not good business for the most part. If you want to sell this stuff, run the the same advertisements in the collectible magazines. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have some Hummels or Yadro or whatever it happens to be. Uh, and there are people that are looking at If you have pieces someone's looking for, they're going to buy them. Sure. And there also, you might want to go to some of the shows where, you know, you, you rent uh, either table space or a little booth space or right. sublet some space where you can show your things. What I'm, looking, I, what I'm really looking for is, is maybe in the next uh, three, four, five years down the line when they're, when they're all old and retired mm -hmm. is the impact of someone, uh, you know, winning a, a contest I, well, and getting all of them. And that's well, I think that's a, I just, as I said, in my opinion, only my opinion, it makes great copy, but poor fodder. I do wish you well. I'm Bruce. We're talking at Monroe, Ohio. Hello there. Welcome to my world. Uh, I'm calling, uh, trying to head off a problem. Uh, thanks a lot for taking my call. You're very, very um, welcome, dear. We're trying to find out some information on if Medicaid and Medicare uh, el eligibility the same in all no. the states. No. Well. Wait, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. Mm -hmm. You mean the same individual no matter where they are? Yes. Medicare would be the same. Medicaid may or may not be the same. I'm not sure. Medicaid is a is Medicare is available to everybody over the I was sixty five. Okay. Medicaid has income um requirements or lack of income requirements. Can you refer me to some place where I can get information for this. The thing is, we are in Ohio, and we are trying to get help from for someone uh, that is an aunt that is a, in a state away from us. Well, you're going to have to inquire in that state. Medicare uh -huh. is available to people over 65 years old. Okay. Right? Okay. Who are American citizens and so on and so forth under the Social Security program. You to apply for it, and that's the ball game. Uh -huh. Medicaid is available uh, is 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 designed for people who don't have any money we're just near broke okay now what, what's the situation uh the situation is an elderly aunt and um she has li very little income uh and we have uh her house has been assigned to us and whoa, i whoa, whoa 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 what do you mean your house has been assigned her, to you her house uh, her house was uh, signed over as a life estate, and we're not real sure how that is. And well, we're wait, wait a while, wait mm -hmm. a while. You see, all these things come into play because you're not allowed to give your assets away so you can collect charity. Well, that's we're talking about a house that's $10,000. Well, but Medicaid, honey, I mean, I don't mean to be, be cruel, mm -hmm. but you see, Medicaid is essentially charity. Okay. And you're not supposed to give your money away so you can collect charity. That $10,000 is supposed to be used for your aunt's welfare. Now, a life estate means that you, that she gives it to you, but during her lifetime, she can use it. Yes, and you and can't, she and you, there. And you can't sell it. But that, mm -hmm. how long ago did you do this? Well, this was years ago. Oh, hold on. Just mm -hmm. take it. These are all important little details. How long ago did she sign it over to you? Uh, probably... 20 years ago. Oh, in that case, there's nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about. Yeah, this is like 20, 20 years ago when we were dealing with another death in the family. And and so as not to get complicated, she while she was still able to think real clearly, and she still thinks clearly now. Okay. But we're well, that, that's, well, that, the time is, just trust me this one, the time is okay. Okay. I mean, this isn't something recent. How much income does she have? Um, she has minimal, minimal income. Well, minimal for for uh, Donald Trump might be about forty or fifty thousand a week. Mm, no, I don't think so. Uh, I may be looking. We may be looking at um, eight to ten, maybe twelve thousand a year, if that much at all. And, and what are her needs? Is she in a nursing home? No, or? she is at home. But our concern is that with the distance separating us, if a nursing home care come, what steps being this far between us do well, we need to take in order to help her? Well, the problem is that you're not going to be able to do it very well from long range. I know. That's the reality. 
So, you know, what kind of steps do you take in order to be prepared for this? Well, there's nothing really that you can do right now. She's not she's eligible for Medicare, which I assume that she has. But she's paid. She signed up for Medicare. I think that she has. She she's very hesitant to discuss these matters. Well, there's but and as far as Medicaid at this at this intersection, there's little. I know of nothing you can do. Mm -hmm. She has no need for it, and she has income sufficient to take care of herself. When she is impoverished, I think they only allow you fifteen hundred bucks in assets. Fifteen hundred dollars in assets, and we're talking about total. Total. In order to collect Medicaid. That's correct. I believe that's the number. Okay, and I would need to uh, contact Texas for this. If that's where she is. If yes. that's where she is. But you can't do very much now until it's required, to my knowledge. Okay. Um, well, the, could, would the life estate with us, the house being in our name, right. would that at all put us under an obligation to pay if she no. does enter a nursing home? No. Okay. But her interest extinguishes when she goes away. I see. Well, I, I guess that leaves me about, you know, we were, we're very concerned and when she is not able to she's not real interested in, in us doing anything about it right now but mm -hmm. our concern is if she should get sick instantly what well if she we gets take? sick instantly you're gonna have to get on an airplane mm -hmm. that's what it comes down to okay. and if it were me if i were you i'd try to find time to go down and see her now and get the, the feel of the land find out what t nursing facilities are available mm -hmm. you know it's not just not a question of well she needs a nursing home we'll put her in mm -hmm. there may not be anything available under medicaid because medicaid beds are are limited in most institutions they're limited because they don't make the 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 nursing institution doesn't make as much money uh, well okay then if we can you put your name on a waiting list for this if you're not ready to go into it not really no because what happens when you do need it they come up and say we got a bed for you uh -huh. no I don't believe so dear okay well I, I think that's helped me a whole lot at uh, least to clarify some of the things in my mind I think what you seriously ought to consider doing uh -huh. is taking either go down to where she is or in the alternative to see if there's rec uh, accommodations in the where you live and have her move to where you are in the event which is probably the better thing to do mm -hmm. if she was going to be in a nursing home would it be better to have her someplace close to you where you can visit well, her I would someplace? much prefer that if I could get her to do it well but you see if she's institutionalized that at that point you may be able to get her to do it mm -hmm. and furthermore you might want to ask her to give you power of attorney so that uh, you wouldn't have to go to the court to have things done. While she's in her present frame of mind and able to handle her own affairs, uh -huh. it would be well to have her execute a durable power of attorney so that if the time comes when she can't make her own decisions. Then with then, the distance separating us, do you sometimes need a power of attorney to someone other than a family member? You could, it could be anyone, but I would suggest it would be appropriate to have it be you or your husband. Okay. I wish you well, dear. Thanks very much. I'm Bruce Williams. Hang in for more. Hi, the young fellow in Elkhart, Indiana. Got himself into a jam with a moving company, and I have a mover from Syracuse, New York, on the horn. He pulled off the road to say hello. Hello there. Hello. Hey, I'm awfully glad you took the time, my friend. Talk to me. Well, I, I think that uh, what this gentleman probably ended up doing when he began his, his uh, contact with a moving company is that he probably had to fill out some sort of mini-credit application. And on there, there was terminology that said that his, his uh, move was subject to credit approval. Mm -hmm. And I think his only leverage at this point really is to probably to go back to the agent in Arizona that booked his move, who technically, according to most van lines, is on the hook until they get him to pay uh -huh. or auction off his storage goods, and then they're still liable for the balance, the difference in the balance. Yeah, but do they, do they have any liability if they do this? Not really. Hmm. I, I doubt it. Um, if they auction it off, you mean? Yeah, I mean, and he was, he his position is he was misled. Whether he was or not is something I'm not totally sure about. Very you know, t typically, the contracts will call for again subject to credit approval. Um, they should have the agent in Arizona should have had that approved prior to his goods going on the van. Absolutely, so that, well, I would have no quarrel with that. Right. You see, so that it could have been addressed at that point. Right. Um, had it not, that's why I, I say the only leverage I think he's got is to go back to that agent and try and strike a deal with them. Because right now they hold a certain amount of liability with their van line. Mm -hmm. What would yeah. you say he ought to say to them? Well, you know, he, he can say that my goods are 
They're worth uh, X number of dollars. It's not enough to cover the charges. Uh, you're going to end up looking to eat some of this, at the storage charges uh, for the agent that's now storing it in, there, in uh, Indiana. And uh, we need to try and work something out. Maybe they'll take a, a second look at his, his uh, payment, uh, reduce what he owes, and try to uh, get it out of storage as quick as possible. Mm-hmm. It's about all he can do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I, I, I think the only thing he can do is really to go through the agent in Arizona. Very well. I thank you very much, my friend. You're welcome. Have a good one. Okay. Elkhart, did you hear all that? Yes, sir, I did. Well, have you tried the guy in Arizona? Uh, we contacted them once, and the agent was out. Um, <laughs> they said I would have to go through their regional office here in Indiana, and I'm in the process of dealing with them um, as far as why they turned down a cosigner because, to my knowledge, that's why you have a cosigner because your credit is bad. That's true, but the problem is the cosigner has to be very, very good. Mm-hmm. How good is the cosigner? Um, as far as I know, she hasn't really applied for a lot of credit, but she has no bad credit. Well, but that, but but not good. Not the lack of bad credit is not good credit. Right. How old is she? She's uh, sixty-five. Oh, okay. And she's a solid citizen. Been around for a while. Yes, sir. What relationship is she to you? She's my wife's grandmother. But grandma has no money, huh? No. No. With no money, I mean, how much credit can she have? Yeah, true. Good luck, my friend. Thank you. I'll get back to that guy in Arizona, as he recommended. Very, very difficult. But, uh, you know, you, when, you, when you start fudging on applications and then you got a problem, you do have a problem. And that, that's a whole other story altogether. Richmond, Virginia, hello there. Hey, Richmond, are you there? All right, Bloomington, Indiana. Hello there. Yes, I am. Hi. Good evening, Bruce. Well, good evening. Um, uh, excuse me, I'm just a little bit nervous. This is the first time I've ever called any oh, radio show. I'm sure that's true. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> yes. Um, what I have is, is I'm contemplating um, changing jobs and moving from where I'm at. Uh, no problem there. Um, I don't know if I'm going to get the job because I won't be able to apply until January. Why is that? Um it's a it's a union plant. <laughs> and that's just when they take applications. Is that right? Yeah, mm-hmm. I was really surprised um, because I would have put an application in a couple months ago. But mm-hmm. anyway, they just do it every quarter. Um, but what I've got is I'm also in the middle of a lease. And um, you mean on uh, where you live? You mean yes, where I live. Mm-hmm. Um, I lease my apartment, and the lease doesn't end until j- the end of July. Now, I understand, of course, that. If I move out ahead of time, um, I'm obligated to pay until the landlord gets somebody in. And I have no problem with that, except that in January, my landlord uh, leaves the town for three months. Mm -hmm. Now, say I apply the first of January, I get the job, Mm -hmm. you know, and I've got to move right away. Um, You've got a problem. (laughs) Yeah, am I, you know, I just wasn't sure. You know, d- does a landlord have any obligation? Well, yeah, he has to yeah. throw it. He doesn't have any obligation yeah. to, to kill himself and yeah. change his schedule for, well, for well, your benefit, course. no. Of course. I you don't have to. He should, he should have somebody run an ad, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, how quickly would you have to, to beat it? Um, I intend on putting on there that I'm, I'm available right away. It probably they would, you know... They get a number of applications, I'm sure. So that was, but you have no idea that. No, I, I really don't have any idea. Because it would be much, it would be much more to your advantage to say to the landlord, "Let me try to sublet it." Uh, yeah, I don't. Well, or let yeah. me try to rent it for you. Act mm-hmm. as your agent. Yeah, okay. You, you're out of, yeah. in other words, to show some extra cooperation mm-hmm. on your part. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If he's not going to be a, he probably goes to Florida or something. Yeah, right? he does. <laughs> and and I, I live in a duplex, and I've seen the other. I've lived here a number of years, and I've seen the other, you know, people move out in the other half mm-hmm. um, a number of times in January, and it just sits there. I mean, mm-hmm. there's no for rent sign out, uh, no ads or anything. And um, mm-hmm. well, unfortunately, you've got a bad sense of time. <laughs> well, uh, the, the present job is becoming unbearable, so it's sort of. What do you do? Um, I work in a clerical office. Yeah, and, and the new job is out of town, huh? Yeah. yeah it's How far out of town? Factory. It would, um, the, the plant I'm hoping to get into is um, uh, three and a half hours. 
Ooh, yeah. That's, that's... So the, yeah, there's there's three different plants, and that's one's about two and a half, one's three and a half, and the other one's uh, about three and three and a half or four. All right, then there's no chance of commuting. Yeah. No question about that. Yeah. So. Well, yeah. I would do my okay. best if if it comes to pass. Mm -hmm. Deal the landlord and say, look, you're you're gonna you'll stick around, but you'll come back weekends to show mm -hmm. the place, whoever it takes. Mm -hmm. Okay. How much do you pay in rent? Uh, it's for this area, not too bad. It's um, two seventy five. And how many months do you have to go? Um, well, it's till see, seven, eight right now. Yeah. So. Well, so, I should, was, should have followed my gut instincts and not not renewed the lease. But well, that's okay. another program. Yeah, that is. <laughs> I do wish you well, okay, dear. Thank you. Princeton, New Jersey. Hello there. Hi, Bruce. How are you? I couldn't be better. You're in WHWH country, huh? Yeah, yeah. Um, I have some information for you. You had a uh, question on uh, Friday. One of your about the about the uh, code. Yes. Yeah, and uh, I have the answer. Well, I would really appreciate that. Okay. Let's let's rephrase the question, shall we? Okay. A uh, uh, gentleman called and he wanted to know how he gets that barcode on his product. Where do you apply? You buy it, it. Pardon? You buy it. But where does one? You don't go down to the local ten cent store. No, no. If, if a, such a thing exists anymore. No, there's a place where you get it from. It's called the Uniform Uniform Code Council Incorporated. The Uniform Code Council Inc. Right. All right. Oh, Danny, are you taking all this down? Yeah, I gave your producer the. Oh, app. okay, fine. And where are they located? They're in Dayton, Ohio. But how did they get the lock on this? I don't know that. I just know that that's where you have to go to get it. Hmm. What does it cost? Uh, and I don't know that either. Uh, I have a friend who actually is a manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And I heard your question, and I figured he would know. And he so did. I asked him, and he did. And he had the address and the phone number. Well, then you gave all to Dan? Yeah. Good, because tomorrow, I will either I'll call him or I'll have Dan call and get the rest of the particulars. I'd be interested in how somebody got a... Uh, I don't think the word monopoly is a term I'm looking for. Yeah. Maybe it is. But that's well, the only place you can go to get a barcode? Yeah. Yeah, and, and the way it works is actually there's there's a bunch of numbers on the bottom. There's a first number all by itself. It's usually a zero or a one. Hold on now. I'm getting my, I got my can of soda here, and okay. I think it's got a barcode on it. Let's take a look here. Come on, there must be, oh, yeah, you can just barely, yeah, there's a bar. Yeah, okay, there's a whole bunch of numbers, right. zero. Right, the first number denotes whether it's consumable product or a uh, usable product, not, right. well, not, not a Well, this is a can of product. soda, so zero must make consumable. Food, right. Right. Then the next number. That's a four in this case. There should be a bunch of numbers together after that. Uh, I'm trying to see if there's the, this is the number in red on, oh, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, there's a, there's a, a little dinky number on the bottom of plate. you got to hold this to the right light. It's one, this sort of kid would buy a Coke. Uh-huh. And then it's a six, one, two. Right. Then a four. Right. Then a three, oh, two, one, four. Right. Then above that in red, very big, we can really read it as zero, and mm -hmm. then a number, a six digit number, and then a followed by a two. Sounds like a very complicated one. Well, for a lousy can of Coke, for huh? a lousy can of Coke, Well, yeah. no, I but, shouldn't but call a lousy like, can. If you take, like, a book or a magazine, they all have them on there now. Mm, yes, almost everything. Do you, have a, do you have, like, a book there or a magazine? Not handy, no. Not handy. Okay, well, the first group of numbers is the manufacturer. That's the number that you buy. That's That becomes, your like, your phone number. Mm-hmm. And that, that, if you pick up like a package of General Electric light bulbs, right, they're all the that same. first five numbers will be on everything, whether it's a pack of soft light bulbs or a three-way bulb. or oh, I'll be darned. Well, unfortunately, this half hour went away, but I really thank you for your diligence, my friend. I do indeed. Stick around. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. All righty. I was chatting with a gentleman in Princeton, New Jersey, who was generous enough to do a little homework for me, and I'm told you got something else on your mind. Yeah, I have a question. Yes, um, sir. I have a small business. What kind of business? Uh, it's a uh, design business, and um, I have a the, I have a frustrating dilemma. It's not. It's more of a of a uh, annoyance than than a real problem, but it is a problem because it can mount up. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of people over the over the course of a year that will, in the vernacular, stick me. Don't, don't we all? Don't we all, yeah. And um, the thing is, is that I see them all the time because it's a small town. Mm -hmm. And if you turn them over to a collection agency, they only deal with what's called um, commercial stuff. They don't want to deal with what they call retail, which is the, uh, sure they do. the regular. Well, they, they won't. I, well, I mean, I have a retail store not too far from you, and I can tell you we got a collection agency. 
that will deal with small accounts of a couple hundred dollars? Oh, absolutely. Without question. Yeah. Without like to, question. I would like the name. Because well, I can't I've, give it to you on the air, but since you were generous enough to do this for me, if... Um, I give your producer my name. Uh, yeah, you hang, yeah, and I'll give you a call uh, about two breaks from now. Okay. How would that? Well, okay. I'm not sure I can get the information. I'll, I'll, I'll call you anyway, and then um, okay. I'll give you a number where you can call one of my guys because... Oh yeah, we have. I've, I've just found that you know that it's like you know if you turn over to an attorney, they cost more an hour than what the bill is. Well, what, these guys charge forty percent. Yeah, but it's better forty percent of nothing is better than. You know. Well, yeah, it's but it's strictly on a on, on a performance basis. Right. But I've I've turned it over to, to some people like that, and the, the the bigger agencies have come back and they've always said, uh, you know, we just couldn't do anything and well, we couldn't find the people. I mean, and I said I see them all the time. I don't know how you can't find them. Well, I mean, you have an address and a phone number yeah. and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, I'm surprised because they said, you know, we well, tell you what, I will give you a call if you uh, you have Denny has your phone number. I'll give you a call next no, hour. No, he doesn't. So. I have to give it to him. Pardon? I have to give him. Uh, you just hang on. Give the number to Big Dan, and you and I will talk sometime in the next, say, half hour. Des Moines, Iowa. Hello there. Yes. Uh, Des Moines. I, I'm a little nervous, too. In October, my wife and I took a tour on a cruise. Yeah, where'd you go? To uh, uh, Cozumel. Grand oh, yeah, the Western, uh, the uh, Western Caribbean. Right. And yeah. The Cozumel, let me see. You went probably with the Cozumel, Grand Cayman, and maybe... Uh, uh, Ocho Rios. Ocho Rios uh, in Jamaica, and maybe even Key West. No, we went back to Miami. Okay. I know the one you went on. Okay. And we were delayed getting out of Des Moines by weather in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they had that problem yesterday. And Weather well, in Minneapolis. It was rain. You know, yesterday was snow. Yeah. So yeah. when we got there, our flight was luckily held up by mechanical problems. Mm -hmm. After it was held up for the mechanical problems, it was canceled. Mm -hmm. So we missed the uh, flight out of there to get to our first uh, stop. You, you had to pick it up at Cozumel, I imagine. Right. Yeah, that's a, that, that does happen. If you, did the cruise line arrange the, uh, the, the, uh, the ship for the, the, the uh, airplane for you? Right. Yeah, they... They cut it too fine, in my opinion. Many of the cruise lines cut that too fine. Well, what happened, too, after we got the first interruption of it, they flew us to um, Miami. Yeah. And we had a, another one of their airplanes had a mechanical problem. Yeah. So we, didn't get in, we got into Cancun at 1030 at night mm -hmm. on the second day of our cruise. Yeah. And I was wondering, what's fair? On this well, there's nothing's fair. I don't think you're going to find they're going to do much for you except give you something off the next cruise. Oh. It's your responsibility to get there on time. Okay. And it's a practical matter. <sighs> when you fly, and uh, the this is kind of hard to get across to people who don't fly too regularly, and that may or may not apply to you. I do fly often. Okay, well, then you know better than I do. Time to spare, go by air. Stuff happens. you got to leave your... Isn't that true? Right. You gotta leave. You have to. You absolutely have to leave a cushion, or you're in, you're in a world of trouble. Particularly if you fly. Uh, well, of course, you weren't in the bad weather. October no. certainly isn't a, isn't isn't a, isn't the time of year I'd be. You know, this time of the year I start to get nervous. Depending where I'm going, if I'm going to Florida, no. If I'm going to go for Denver, yeah, I get nervous about Denver and uh, this time of the year because of the snow problem and uh, Minneapolis as well because of the potential for snow. Chicago. There's another one you got to be a little careful of uh, once you get into the winter months. Well, what's your experience with what would a cruise line do for you when they've uh, done something like this with uh, making well, it right for you on the cruise? Or well, they don't. They don't. Uh, <laughs> That's been my experience. Yeah, well, making it right. Uh, generally, uh, they what they will do, in, in, if there's a beef of any kind, of any consequences, they will give you so much off your next cruise. Mm -hmm. What did they offer you? Nothing so far in almost five weeks. I've mm. been getting an answer out in five weeks now. I'm surprised. I, I, I'm surprised they didn't offer you two or three hundred bucks a head off the next cruise. Yeah. Maybe I, a little more than that. Yeah, the airline hasn't got back to us. Neither. And well, the airline, unfortunately, there's not much you can do with them. Let's be realistic there. Mechanicals sometimes are real and sometimes aren't. What if it wasn't real? Well, how, you, how do you prove that? Well, I don't know. I mean, that's what I was asking. Well, you can't. I mean, okay. it, all you got to do is nod to a mechanic and say... And the mechanic says the Framus valve is is suspect. Mm -hmm. That's all he's got to say. 
What are you going to do? Criticize him if he's wrong and it's not suspect? Right. There's no way you can do that. How could you could never criticize a, a mechanic for being too cautious? Right. So he's not sticking his neck out, right? Right. Uh, I off I get very very suspect. That's all. Most time, this is not accusatory. When I see only three people waiting for an airplane and it gets a mechanical, right? Somehow or other, that makes me a little bit suspect. Now, sometimes it'll go anyway because they need the airplane at the next stop, you know, to go out of there where it may be fully booked or you know uh, profitably booked. I got another part of it though. I asked for, uh, well, I listened to your show quite often, mm -hmm. and I did buy the travel insurance and I also paid by credit card. Mm -hmm. Are there some options available? Well, the travel insurance, that's something else. I'm surprised there isn't some coverage there. Well, so far they haven't got back. I have to get some information from the airline before they'll do anything. Okay, well, you, you have to confirm, you'll have to, con the airline will have to confirm all of the things you just described to me. Well, they're not been, it's been almost three weeks now since you, I asked did you, for Did you use a travel agent to book this trip? Yes, I did. Well, you call a travel agent. So, I'm, look, huh? you're the guy or gal that took my money. I expect some extra service out of you because of this. I realize it's not your fault, but that's why I went to you and not going directly to the cruise ship. And that's what I've done so far. And what do they say? Well, they're working on it. They're still working on it. Yeah, I mean, it's, not, it doesn't sound like they're working too hard. Yeah. If they called their rep and said, look, I've got to have this information, tell it to me, I'm sure it could be done. One other part, we were left to fend for ourselves every place we landed or on, or came in by the uh, airlines. Mm -hmm. There was nobody to meet us from the uh, cruise line. Well, that's not unusual. Either. Okay. That's just, Unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, it was very, because I've told everybody I know, no, I won't mention cruise line mm. or the airlines, but I mean, it's a bad publicity, and I listen to you talk on the show. Absolutely. You're telling people don't go to that cruise line. The airline, I'm not sure I'd fall too terribly much to be candid with you. You said you fly a lot, all right? Right. Have you, can you tell me there's an airline you've never had a, that you fly with regularly you've never had a problem with? No. Okay. But not, not three in a row. <laughs> well, but the, yeah, all right. But that may be. But the, nonetheless, and can you tell me there's not an airline that you fly with regularly hasn't done something outstanding from time to time? Sure. Sure, uh, it's it's it, it it seems to wash itself out. But the other thing, the the um, the lack of response is inexcusable. Is there any place that I should be talking to besides my travel agent? Not anybody. Okay, I really don't. I mean, you can call the DOT as far as the uh, com airline complaints, but they just book them. There's not much they're going to do for you. All right. I do wish you well, my friend. I'm sorry your cruise wasn't as as pleasant as it might have been. Hopefully, the next one will be. I'm Bruce Williams. Stick around. This is TalkNet. Paul Kachuk, Connecticut. Hello. Hi, Bruce. Glad to talk to you. I'm so glad you're here, kid. What's on your mind? I have a kind of an interesting situation, Bruce. Um, I was arrested by a, a bank, a local bank. You were The bank didn't arrest you. They made preferred charges. Well, they, they asked that the police take me away. Right. Why did they do that? Well, it starts out, I, uh, I put some money in my fiance's account. And uh, she was distributing the money for a project I was working on, an automobile restoration. Well, but, the, but be, use common terms. You you, you said you dis she distributed. And what are you talking about? Well, she made you, sure that you I spent it on the proper things. You deposited you personally or she put it in her, your account? She account. put it in my account, in her account. All right, then she made a deposit in her account. Right. And then I had some... Uh, Expenses come up, so she cut me a check, and I took it to a, a bank um, just over the state line here, and they refused to cash the check because they had been bought by this particular bank, but they weren't online yet, and there was some interstate banking laws. They told me I had to go to the bank where she did her banking in our own state. So I drove, proceeded over to her bank, and uh, there was only a drive-up window open, I gave them the check and I gave them my driver's license and um, a registration card that I have from work. Mm -hmm. And I gave them uh, a ins health insurance card, all the ID that I had. And they told me that they wouldn't cash a check without a major credit card, which I find I find hard to believe I'm the only person without one. No, oh, you are there. You are a good company. There's lots of people without major credit cards. And um, I, is your driver's license a photo ID? Yes, it is. Hmm. And uh, I asked if <laughs> I could see the manager. Right. And they said that I would have to come back the following day. Well, I had obligations. I 
told them that it was imperative, you know, that, that I got this check cash. The money was in the account if they'd like to check it, which they never did. Mm-hmm. You probably had some clerk there, some teller. Mm-hmm. Well, I started getting a bit irate. I didn't, you know, use profanities as such, but I told them, you know, I want my money, and they said they weren't going to give it to me. Please leave. Mm-hmm. And I explained to them, if they're not going to cash my check, then, you know, please, call the police. I figured maybe well, they... Was, what, now, why would you say that? I figure I'm a local citizen. Maybe they could identify me or run my license. It was, I was trying to get around the objection. Correct? Mm-hmm. That would not have been my choice, but go ahead. Well, I parked my car, and I'm standing there waiting. And... uh Cruisers come down the road with lights of blaring and take my statement and they tell me not to go anywhere, which I wasn't planning on. Mm-hmm. They come out and they're going to give me a citation and for what? For breach of peace. And they said that the bank pushed the panic button. They had to take me in. Uh, no, I'm a professional person. I'm not like a, a mm-hmm. local hooligan. Why do they anything. push the button? What does that mean? They thought I was, uh, they, they're termed it as a severe threat. You're outside the bank in a drive-in window, and you're a severe threat. Right. I mean, you'd have to be a fool to figure that, to think that way. Seriously, I mean, I'm not trying to condone, and you may have may have lost it a little bit, but nonetheless, what kind of a threat is somebody outside a drive-in window? Correct. So they took me down, they printed me, and released me, took me back to my car, and I and I left. But I was uh, somewhat aggravated by the whole situation. Well, you got to go to court too, don't you? Yes, I've. Um, Got the services of a lawyer, and the charges um, it so happened that the the um, judge or whoever heard the, the case had a similar situation, not to the same degree, and uh, gnarly the charges. I'm sorry? He gnarly the charges. What was the term you used? Gnarly. Spell it. N-A-R-L-Y. Um, it means... Um, they dropped with no contest or something. All right, go ahead. I, didn't, I don't know the term. And um, now I'm uh, pursuing a suit against the bank for not honoring the contract that she had with, the, or that the bank had with my fiance mm-hmm. to honor her checks, and mm-hmm. for not uh, for arresting me and not honoring my identification. Well, it seemed to me that on balance, what you tell me that you may have an action against them. It also seems to me you didn't do the smart thing. You really needed the money that day, right? I did. Why don't you go to a a check cashing service? They have much slender, more, they charge a little more, but they have a little slipper rule. You know, the rules aren't as stringent. You go back to the bank next day and explain the circumstance to somebody of substance. What do you mean by a check cashing, sir? There are check cashing places all over the club, a lot. What city did this happen in? Uh, Mystic, Connecticut. I would guarantee you somewhere in that area there's a check cashing service. That's all they do is cash paychecks, cash checks for people, out-of-state checks and so forth. So it's almost a sub-banking system. Well, they might charge you two or three bucks for the privilege. Right. But so what? Is it? um, Because they were going to keep it in their account for a couple of days. Um, For what purpose? To, to see if there was proper funds in the account. Well, no. Was there? But was there money in the account, or did your, did your girlfriend just, or your fiance, whatever, did she just make a deposit that day or the day before? No, this had been in there for months. For months, M O N T H S. Right. Okay. Then, there, then, then there'd be no reason to hold the check. Then. Sounds to me like they had some junior bird man in there for, or bird woman or whatever for a teller. They are locked up in there, and they don't have anybody with them except themselves, no officers and whatever, and they're afraid to move, afraid to do anything on their own, which is understandable because if they do something, they'll get chewed out, and if it's the right thing, they won't get any credit for it, so that's the the business community's fault. But nonetheless, that sounds like the circumstance here. So you would say I would definitely pursue uh, well, a I, suit. What does your, your attorney say? He th- thinks we have a very good case. In well, fact, he finds it somewhat interesting because of, uh, I don't know, I guess it's going to set some precedence in a, I mean, to a degree. Well, in that case, he wants to make law. Let him go for it. Sounds good. I do wish you well. But next time, as I said, 
you get in a situation like that, just go to a check cashing service. I bet you almost anything, they'd have cashed that check with no problem. I'm Bruce Williams. Hang in for more. This is TalkNet. Port Charlotte, Florida, your turn. Welcome to my world. Hey, how you doing, Bruce? All right, guy. How can I help you? Well, uh, first of all, I think you got a great show here. Thank you. Uh, I got a question concerning a house. Uh, my grandmother rents me one of her houses. And because of some tax purposes, she wants to sign this one over to me. Mm -hmm. But I have some uh, outstanding bills, and I was just wondering how far can these creditors go uh, if I own a home? Well, they can come after it. They can actually uh, make you sell it or what? No, they can certainly get liens against it, though. How much do you owe? Uh, it's about $5,000 total. Mm -hmm. With how, between how, different ones. And how far in arrears are you? Uh, a couple months. Why does Grandma want to give you the house? Well, she's having some problems of her own. What kind of problems? Uh, tax purposes. But not purposes. What kind of problems? Uh, the taxes on the place are expensive. Uh, she pays for her taxes, and if she signs this one over into my name, I would get a homestead exemption. Why can she not get a homestead exemption? She's already got one. Oh. <laughs> On her house. In other words, this is, this is the house that you, you, you live in by yourself, is that correct? Well, my wife and my son. I see. Well, what I'm getting to is the grandma doesn't live there at all. Correct. And if you own it as a homeowner, you can get the homestead exemption. Correct. So you get at least right. a portion of a ta some tax relief. Right. You're in Florida, right? Yes. What does that amount to, about 600 bucks a year? Uh, it's close to 900 now. Is it worth going through all this for 900 bucks? I think so. Well, how much is the house worth? Uh, we just had it appraised, and it's uh, 49000 Well, you're going to have to, your, your grandmother's also going to have to do this appropriately against your lifetime exemption. Otherwise, she's going to have to pay some gift taxes. Uh huh. How much is your grandma worth? Uh, I really couldn't answer that. Oh, I don't. Give me a ballpark. Half a million, million, two million? No, no, no. Not well, that much. Oh, okay. So then, she's, then she's under the $600,000 lifetime. Right. And she will have to, if she wants to give you this, pro give you, well, actually, she could do it another way. If she really wanted to, to, to fool around with the thing a little bit. You said you got a kid, right? Right. How old is a child? Uh, six. Well, I would want to mess with her. Because she could give 10000 to you now, 10000 to your wife now. Mm -hmm. And then ten thousand to your right the January first, and ten thousand to your wife on January first. That's forty of the forty nine. You probably get away with it without even claiming against the lifetime. But she we should have an account and set that up for. Her. So if she was to go uh, tomorrow and sign the house over, she no, would have no, 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 no. You can't do it that way. That's, what do I just get through saying to you? Get an accountant to handle it. Uh huh. Because she can only give ten thousand dollars to you and ten thousand to your wife in nineteen ninety four. Right without any tax implications. Okay. Then she can do it all over again on January 1, 1995. 10 to you and 10 to your wife. Understand? But the answer to your question is yes, your creditors can come after, uh, can, can file a tax lien against your home. Well, I'm not a tax lien, a lien. Yeah, they, they go to court, get a judgment, get a lien against your home, and, and you can't sell it unless you satisfy the lien. I'm hopeful that you'll be able to retire to 5000 and that won't be an issue. I do wish you well, Guy. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Board, it's up to her to talk to these people, not you. Okay, well, we did have a meeting. Not we. We. Not we. Her. You have no standing whatever in this. As a you, household? You have no standing. Repeat after me. I have no standing. I have no standing. That's right. You're nobody in this. And I, just like every other husband or her spouse. <laughs> okay. In this instance, she is an adult. And it's up to her. Now, if she might want to go to her union representative and see if there's something to be done. Well, that that's my question. Is there... I don't know that. Even if we can't... Uh, Not we. She. There you go. Even if she can't... Uh, See, we talked about, she talked about possibly grieving. <laughs> it's killing you when they say, say we when you want to say she, huh? That's right. <laughs> uh, she talked about grieving. All right, she but, might be able to. Well, they filed the procedure, you know, uh -huh. to the letter of the law. In that case, they're home free. So. Your wife made a mistake, and it's, it's a relatively modest mistake. 
you're, you're, pay, you're, pay, you're paying a couple thousand dollars to learn that you've got to follow the details. Would it be worthwhile to pursue having them change their procedures so that some other poor schmuck doesn't come along and... Well, first of all, watch the words. I used a word I don't think you understand just now. Uh, and I and I, I don't mean that to patronize you, but you just use the word that I don't think if you if you anglicize the word you just use, you would use it in polite company. Okay. Uh, it is if 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 you are a member of that community, and you want to go to a board of education meeting and make a suggestion, I, they may or may not listen to you. If your wife wants to go through her union and and make a grievance, she certainly has a right to do that. But that that wouldn't come to anything, would it? Uh, probably not. But I don't know that she has very much to lose by trying. But they're going to come back you, and say. Uh, they're going to come back and but a lot of people may know what I'm trying to right, get to. Right, right. Whether, well, they, whether somebody sends the original back or, or, or photocopies and sends it back, wherein lies the difference? Well, yeah, I guess I guess it could have been that way, too. There ain't any difference is my least. But, it, but it seemed like uh, they were almost trying to deceive me, though. Why do you say that? Well... Well, the idea in itself was good. I was denied. I was denied funding for for the business idea itself. All right. Well, you think it was good. Let's put it that way. Right. Oh, it, yeah. it may and it may well be, but that doesn't make it good. Is what I'm trying to get to. I, I've had a lot of what I thought were great ideas, and right down a toilet. <laughs> yeah. So you know. Okay. Well. What What was the idea? Do you want to tell me? Um, it's the information storing on CD-ROM. And what did you, what, did you what, what, you were looking to borrow money from these guys, is that Right, it? to borrow money, to buy the equipment, to actually... How much money are you going to put into this? Uh, myself, very little. How less much? Than, less than a thousand. Well, you see... But see, this, this was to help low-income low people, is mm -hmm. what it was designed for. So there was actually, you didn't have to put in no money of your own. Nothing at all? Nothing at all. Boy, I'd be opposed to that. <laughs> I would be. You're laughing. Why are you laughing? Well, I'd be opposed to giving people enough money to start a business with nothing of their own at risk. I think that you ought to have money at risk. And, and, oh, and, sure. If I had, if I well, had but, the money. Well, wait a while. How, let's talk about you a little bit. How old are you? 27. 27. What do you do for a living? Right now, I'm unemployed. I, well, have, three, I have three children. Why are you unemployed? Divorced. Why am I unemployed? What's your neck going here? Why are you unemployed? I'm unemployed. There ain't no jobs around here. Is there, are there any minimum wage jobs flipping hamburgers? Oh, yeah. Well, it's better than no job at all is where I look at it. Yeah, I got to support three kids on top of that, too. Well, how much is, is two and a half hundred bucks a week better than nothing a week? Maybe it isn't. Oh, so, yeah, it's better than nothing a week. Well, then why don't you... But, I mean, you're talking to a guy who's done that stuff. What I'm getting at is if you're looking for a job, what, do you, what, what kind of a job are you looking for? What kind of a job am I looking for? Yeah. Well... Maybe just just a management position is what I'm looking for, actually. What that's you, that's what, what I've done before. Well, I was going to say, what's your background? Do you have a college education? Uh, a year and a half. Much? No. You, then the answer is no. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been in management for uh, four years. Doing what? Managing retail stores. All right. And what happened? Uh, moved to a small town. That was the problem. Why got, did you... got laid off. The business, the business was shut down. Mm -hmm. We moved to a small town. This is where I grew up. You just moved there without having a job waiting for you? Right. Where, how far are you from a big town? Uh, 70 miles. Well, why don't you go looking for a job there? Don't have a car. <sighs> See that? They have a bus? No, no. No bus going over there? Not not to, not to the city, no. What city? Des Moines. And you, you, there's no way you can take a bus from Jefferson City to, to Des Moines? There's, no, no way. No way. It's 70 miles. I understand, I understand how far well, 70... Well, actually, the Greyhound don't even run through here no more. Hmm. Not Jefferson. Used to. No way you could go to Jefferson and live personally? I mean your family. Just you? Get a furnished room? What am I going to do with my kids? Leave them in Jefferson. Leave them in Jefferson. Where are they now? <laughs> with me. And your parent and your wife? Is gone. Hmm. Oh, you're, you're a single parent? Mm-hmm. Hmm. You have family in Jefferson? I have a grandmother. Can she look after the kids? Uh, she's handicapped. Mm -hmm. You gotta tell you that your hands full, kid. Yeah. Well, see, I'm I'm only trying, and 
And that loan program I thought was going to work, and the and the idea itself would have worked. Yeah, but, but you see, you're not. But uh, even uh, even uh, I don't mean to be insensitive, but even uh, an idea of that kind is going to take time before money starts oh, flowing. Oh, sure, sure, I understand. And, and it's not going to happen instantly. No, it's not going to happen overnight. I, I didn't expect that at all. What did your 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 wife took off on you? Is that it? Yeah. Right, lovely. You have nobody but grandma at home. Nope, nobody. That's no, rel no other relatives. Mother lives in Washington. Washington State or Washington D.C. Washington State. Father. Gone. <laughs> well, it just seems to me you're going to have to f see. Uh, I, I don't, as I said, I don't mean to be tough on you, but. But, but a minimum wage job is better than nothing at all. But Grandma can't look after the kids while you're working? No, no way. How old are your children? Two, four, and six. Oh, well, how do you plan on taking care of these people? Well, my kids? Yeah, and work. <laughs> well, you know, I just kind of have to, if I find a good job, hopefully they'll go to daycare. Some of them will be in school pretty soon. My oldest is in school. You know, the others will be in school soon, but, you know, that's why I thought of the idea of you know, having a business in my own home. That's not going to happen. That's just not going to happen. Not realistic. I wish you well, kid. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. We go now to the West Coast, Northwest, Portland, Oregon. Hello there. Yes, good evening, Bruce. Good evening, my friend. Boy, I'm hoping you can help me. <laughs> well, I don't know, kid, but we'll give it our very best effort. How's that? Excellent. I'm in the process of purchasing a businesses right now, and uh, it's in the area of Lake Tahoe. Mm -hmm. and the uh, ski rental business. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the problem I'm having, I guess, is uh, we're putting together some terms and having some difficulty, of course, reaching some sort of agreement. All right. And uh, we've got the down payment worked out. It, it's a fairly healthy down payment. Which one? Well, give me some, uh, uh, some Like 50% down, actually. How much is the business going for? Uh, for 105. Right, what are you up there, by Heavenly? Well, Incline Village. Okay. In that area. Mm hmm And uh, to be paid off over a period of five years at 9%. Sounds, that's about, that sounds reasonable. Sure, sure. But the problem I'm having here right now is that uh, she's asking that I put up collateral. Her fear is that uh, I would purchase the business and then maybe sell off for the business. Well, the, well, the business itself is the collateral. Right. That that was kind of my thoughts also. And, and she's uh, fairly adamant about the collateral bit. Well, does she want to sell a business? <laughs> I'm hoping she does. Well, if she wants to sell a business, she's lucky to find somebody with 50% down. Yes. You tell her I said so. Okay. I mean, serious. For It, it would be, you know, not that $100,000 is chopped liver. Don't misunderstand me. Yes. But it's a relatively small business. Right. And very few people that look to buy small businesses can afford to put 50% down. Mm -hmm. She's being very... Now, how much, what kind of inventory does the business have? Uh, she's got it. And it's uh, estimated at, at 95000 The inventory? Yes. Of course, it, that, that stuff wears out pretty quick. That's correct. Yes, it's just all old skis, basically. It has to be replaced and so on. Yes. I can't believe it. That, that may be... How did she arrive at ninety five grand? That, <laughs> that sounds like about a boxcar load of old skis. Right, right. That's uh, 300 pairs of skis, 300 pairs of boots, bindings, plus uh, several she's, tuning machines. She's figuring these things are worth... Uh, 300 bucks a set. Yes. Isn't that right? Uh, a little 330, well, yeah, about $300 a set, she's saying. Right, right. Well, skis, and, skis and boots. Well, I, I think that's Old. rather high on, on, on used equipment. Mm hmm. Matter of fact, it's on, it's, it's, if you put that at auction, what would it go for? No, I'd have to say probably uh, 120 for a complete setup. Yeah, if you were lucky. Yes. Well, she's got it overpriced by two thirds, and she knows it. Yes. Okay. What else besides the stuff? You, you, you probably get realistically thirty thousand bucks worth of stuff. Right. What else? Uh, like I say, the the ski tuning machines and uh, several have, waxing machines. I have no idea what they're worth. Uh, in the neighborhood of uh, three thousand each, twice. All right. So th nonetheless, the, she the, she knows is not fifty thousand bucks worth of stuff there. Mm -hmm. What's this business to knock off a year? Uh, she's, she's netting, uh, she's got a cash flow somewhere in the neighborhood of 70000 on the average That's, uh, each year. What's it net? Uh, 70000 That's, you said cash flow. Right. That's, how do you define cash flow? Uh, uh 
the income after having paid her expenses. Before debt service. That's correct. Okay, that's, that's, a, that's a decent definition. Mm -hmm. And was that a sustainable number to 70 grand? Uh, she does have some fluctuation there. It, it fluctuates uh, from 65 on up to 75. So but I mean, she could. How did, how did she demonstrate this number to you? Uh, she's given me. I, I haven't been able to see the tax statements yet, but uh, we're, we're working on that. Say. That's, of course, one of the contingencies I've written in. Mm -hmm. Do you have an attorney in this matter? Uh, yes, I do. You have an accountant? Right. Okay. Well, yeah. you're doing okay. Yeah. I, I'm listening uh, to your advice. <laughs> how much does this business gross a year? Uh, she grosses in the neighborhood of uh, 95 to 105 on that. It's hard for me to believe that she's netting 70. Right. Well, part of the thing is that you don't purchase all your equipment each year. That uh... without regard to that, that she she's got rent, insurance must be fairly substantial. Uh, it it is, but uh, she's got it subleased also during the summer, and that. Uh, Helps make up her rent. There's property here, or it, no? It's just a lease. Well, who does she sublease it to? Uh, she subleases to a, a gentleman next door, actually, that uh, runs a restaurant, and he uh, runs a natural foods. I'll be doggone. place right there. So it works out quite well. If the numbers the hold up, I don't think that, that it doesn't sound like too bad a deal. But given the fact that she's getting fifty percent down, she ought to kiss you right in the mouth. Because people that put fifty percent down don't come along every day or every year. Good luck, guy. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Harwich Port, Massachusetts. It's your turn in my world. Hello there. Hi there, Bruce. Hi, guy. How you doing? Good, thank you. I, uh, I've been working on an invention for the past year, and uh, I've applied for a patent on it. And um, I'm trying to figure out what I should do with it. I've got a, um, a gentleman who works with patents who wants I showed him the idea we discussed it he signed a disclosure document before we went into this and then uh, we made some changes on it well back up a little bit you said sure. he works with patents I mean what in what capacity he, he works with uh, direct marketing he people bring him ideas and he'll try to um, get them out in the marketplace how'd you get tied up with this guy um, well while I was in Florida I'm back on Cape Cod that's where I live now um, a friend of mine um, Actually, it was my mom has a client. <laughs> your mother's your best friend. Why not? <laughs> Why not, right? She um, she called me and said she had a client who's working with this gentleman. Gave me the phone number, so I called uh, called this gentleman. When I returned back to the Cape, um, he signed the disclosure document. I didn't want to go too far without that, and he made sure we did that. He said we won't do anything until you get that done. So I thought that was you know uh, a good first step. Showed him the idea of the product. We looked at it together. We discussed the ideas. He didn't like the way it looked. It was a prototype that I put together in a hardware store. Uh, we discussed some ways we might better it. I came back a couple months later, later with a better product that looked a lot cleaner, um, and it has a couple more features to it. What kind of a pro what kind of a project is this? It's a uh, it's in the bathroom, in the shower. It's a new type of shower uh, head device. Mm -hmm. With multiple purposes, uh, nothing that's on the market right now. Mm. Um, so that's the product, and um, he wants to take it to uh, Canada to a company that does direct to TV with the product. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. you mean direct response? You mean. Right, right. And um, I have several questions for you. One is, um, I, I don't have a lot of money to push it myself. He seems to have the uh, knowledge. He's you know, considerably older than me, 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he's got some uh, um, experience in the in the in, in the business. Mm -hmm. So, um, any ideas on that? Well, I mean, but you say you're asking a tremendously broad question. Well, it is, and um, my next thing is I, I've got some other ideas I've been working on in the in the past uh, in the last year, and I'm not sure how to get them off the ground. What are there are there um, invention? Managers, people that I can go to and say. Well, there are, but you got to be so very careful. Uh, right. There, there. For every every legitimate, you called it manager. Uh, there's there's a dozen out there that are out there to to stick it to you. Yeah. And I, I'm very reluctant to. In fact, I would not re recommend that you go that route. But you got a million ideas. Is that what you're telling me? I've got I've got three or four viable ideas. You know. You, you 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 probably come up with tons of you just said with a previous caller ideas that you thought were great and you know they weren't that great but mm -hmm. I think I've got two or three ideas that are you know especially this shower idea that I've been working on that uh, are viable uh, and could do something well maybe and they very well may be viable right right 
I don't know what to tell you, son. Okay. Because uh, you, you know what my fear is? What? That I'll send you in a direction where somebody will take you. And they're, and, and they're out there. There's so many people out there willing, ready, willing. Boy, are they ready and willing and in many cases able. Right. To take you. I, you know, I sent away to, for this kit, you know, it says send you. Uh, oh, hello. But I didn't <laughs> touch that one. Yeah, I well, just, but, I that, the that's kit. the kind of stuff that I'm. Yeah, and, and and you and I probably both know a lot about that. With skeptical the, about how is that a money, nice way to money, put it? Nothing happens, that type of thing. Um, so I read um, how to patent it yourself. I went through the book. Um, my patent's out there, uh, patent pending, but I've already changed that. So um, what do you mean you've already changed it? I, I've changed it um, enough that it would have to be repatented. Hmm. Um, so when the patent pending comes back. Um, I've got a feeling that it's going to be similar to some other designs that are out there. I did the um, patent research myself. It, mm -hmm. it has some different changes to it, but what I've done to it now makes it unique totally, so I'd have to repatent the idea. Mm -hmm. um, um, I've, I'm in the disclosure document program where you have two years to get the patent you know, mm -hmm. uh, invented. But that's my main concern. You hit the nail on the head when you said there's a lot of people out there who will take you. And, and what would you do if you're a kid who's 29 years old and you've you got some ideas? Well, first of all, you're 29, you're not a kid. Let's start with that. Okay, I'll go with that. Um, and I'm not sure where to send you. I really don't know. I mean, I mean <clears throat> the, the, the standard get yourself a patent attorney, and there's nothing wrong with that, that standard answer. Right. But once you get that far, uh, all of these things require money. Right. That's what it comes down to. And they require some important money to promote to get the product into you know into the marketplace and whatever, right? And that's that's not the easiest thing to find. It's not easy to find, nor is it easy to to, to differentiate. There there are there are I'm sure people out there willing to gamble on on new products, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't know how to begin to find them. Yeah, that's my dilemma. And more important, I wouldn't know who to how to tell you what kind of a litmus test to apply to see if uh, they're honest or not. Right. That's a whole other program. Right. <laughs> That's that's my main question is is what do you do with an idea? Where where can you go? Well, I mean, I have some money. Um, I try to avoid the patent thing because if you go to a patent attorney, you're going to spend a couple thousand there, and if you can do well, it well, then wait a while. If you if you're not prepared to spend a couple of thousand dollars, you're in trouble before you begin. What's that? If you're not prepared. Oh, I am. Then, I'm definitely. I'm, well, I'm and, trying then, to... then why would you avoid a, a patent attorney? Well, let's start with that. Okay, if you get the patent. Yeah. Um, and you spend, let's just say five thousand dollars. Let's say you do. Okay. How much time did you spend on this thing? By by the way, doing it yourself. Um, nine months. How much is your time worth? Um, it's, this has been a spare time effort. Um, well, but but suppose you spent that spare time making hamburgers. Sure, I. I you'd you'd have been ahead of the game in all likelihood. Sure, sure. That's what I'm trying to get to. I guess I'm to. putting sweat equity into the program myself. Yeah, but sweat equity is, if, if your sweat could be better used doing <laughs> something else, Yes. Then, then that's what I think you should be doing. Okay. Do you see what I'm saying? Sure, sure I do. And using a professional, a good patent attorney could put you, in, or possibly, I would say could, possibly could put you in touch with people who, with, with legitimacy. Right. I guess that was my next question, is after you have the patent, let's say you've worked with the patent attorney, then what? Well, the, as I said, a good patent attorney very likely would have some contacts. I'm not going to say that they're going to have the key to the mint for you. Right. But I'd be more comfortable doing that, I really okay. would. And I, this sounds like I'm copping out, and I guess maybe I am. <laughs> well, I, I, I've been, you know, it's been something I've read some books on, and I, I just don't know where to go. And I, I listen to your show twice a week when I'm driving home from Boston, and um, thought I'd give you a buzz. Well, I appreciate the call. I wish I had something more positive for you. Okay. But if I were you, as I said, I would think seriously if you if you if if you have the confidence that you apparently do have in your ideas, I put some money into it. And if it, that that putting money into it means that you've got to put your efforts into something else to to generate those funds, I think that would be money well spent. I do wish you well, Ken. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talknet. Crescent, Pennsylvania. Hello there. Hi, Bruce. Uh, I'm a long-time listener and a first-time caller. Uh, had a situation that uh, popped up on, uh, on me uh, while I was in the uh, process of building a new home, and I was wondering if you might be able to help me out with the problem. Let's talk about it. Well, um, we, uh, as I said, we were building a new home, and um, back in uh, August, while we were building the home, I had to hire an excavator to do some uh, 
finish excavating around my house. Yeah. And uh, in the process of doing the uh, finish excavating, uh, while the excavator was working along the house, kind of uh, uh, finished backfilling and things like that, uh, the excavator ran a dozer lengthwise along my house and as a result uh, cracked the wall. That will happen. Yeah. <laughs> that, and we thought the excavator would know that too. But um, anyway, what ended up happening was it cost me a lot of time because of the crack in the wall. The uh, mortgage broker wasn't, wouldn't, you know, close on the loan on the house until the wall was uh, fixed. So the excavator, uh, whenever the wall was cracked, he came to the inside, looked at the wall, and said that that shouldn't have happened and claimed that it wasn't his uh, fault. So I uh, got in contact with uh, the excavator's in insurance company. And the insurance company um, said that uh, uh, asked me for if we had any soil samples and things like that, and I kind of got the suspicion of where they were headed with that, claiming that uh, they weren't at fault. And uh, eventually, they got back to me and said that they they didn't feel that they were at fault, and that they but that they were still in the process of investigating it. They told me at that time that I should check with my. Uh, homeowner's insurance to get them to cover it and then litigate well, against why whoever. Why would the homeowner's cover it? Under, well, under, under what coverage? Right. The uh, homeowners said the same thing. They said, we don't cover this kind of thing when the uh, basement wall gets cracked. Anyway, what ended up happening was um, their insurance company, the excavator's insurance company, became uh, kind of non-cooperative in getting this to uh, a completion. And uh, the contractor was willing to be cooperative. Uh, the contractor contacted the uh, uh, excavator, uh, excavator's insurance company and wanted to come to some kind of conclusion as to how it was going to get paid for and everything else. Mm -hmm. So eventually the job got done. Yeah, but um, in the meantime, there's money outstanding someplace. Right. And, the, and uh, the, well, the, what ended up happening was the contractor finally got the uh, insurance carrier for the excavator to come to terms with them and they ended up splitting the bill. Hmm. Now, my problem though is after all that's been done, this is now, that was all supposed to be done back in the last week of August. And it actually happened in the last week of August whenever the wall got cracked. Yeah. This is now, uh, you know, we're in the end of November yeah. and interest rates have gone up considerably yeah. uh, since then. And um, the uh, excavator has just recently in the last couple of days sent me a bill for the work that they had done. And what I'm wondering is, do I have any recourse against them to say, well, you know, because of your non-cooperativeness um, and because of uh, the time that was cost because this was all hung up and because the insurance company wouldn't cooperate with the contractor, they scheduled meetings, the insurance company representative didn't show up for the meeting, whatever, um, interest rates have risen uh, the way I gather from about eight and a half to now close to nine and a half percent. How much money is involved? Uh, a little over eight hundred dollars. No, no, I, I, I'm not sure we we're communicating. Oh. How much money were you borrowing? You mean on the house? Yeah. Um, there was the, you, you lost a, you lost a, a, a mortgage. Right. A, or I'm not you didn't lose a mortgage, but you lost a favorable rate. Right. How much? Are you borrowing? I guess the number I'm asking. Uh, approximately seventy-two thousand. For how long? For thirty years. Right. Six. Well, you're not going to keep it for thirty years in all likelihood. Right. right. And how much was were we hassling over? Eight hundred well, bucks. Yeah, it was over eight hundred dollars. Well, you 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 made a mistake by hassling. You should have paid it. Well, I just got the bill in the last couple of days, and that's what I was wondering. Should I go ahead and pay no, that, this? No, no, bill? no, that's not what I'm saying. Oh. I, well, I, I guess what I'm trying to say, however poorly, you should have got the thing resolved, even if it meant paying right. for the, for the, to have the house repaired so you get your mortgage. Well, let's see, the house is, uh, eventually was uh, paid and repaired, I and the contractor that. paid the money. Yes, I'm also, but didn't you tell me that the reason that that, that, that that this there was a lot of procrastination for lack right. of a better term is that right. correct right well I, I'm I, this is great 2020 hindsight uh -huh. what I'm saying to you I think what you should have done was had the work done and hassle about it later when you can see interest rates going up right and not because uh, maybe I'm missing something was it not 
kind of stalled for quite a time? Yeah, for about four weeks. That's all four? Well, four weeks is not long. I don't, I don't think there's nothing that just changed in four weeks. Well, there was, uh, see, in the, in the process then, but what the uh, excavator, um, they refused to come back to the site to finish the work they had started. Yeah. because they said they were given instructions by their insurance company to stay away from the premises. How much time was lost? Well, um, the actual completion of the job was supposed to be around the last week of August, and the actual job got completed um, around the second week of November. I don't think there's been, there, there's been some upward movement on, on interest, but not that much. Mm-hmm. Not a, not not the kind of uh, that, that you've described. Well, yeah, I was told I was told that the interest rates back at that time were hanging right around eight and a half, and now they're around nine and a half. So we're talking maybe three well, quarters of a percent. Maybe three quarters of a point, something like that. that right. might, that's that's a possibility. Now, what I was looking at was that's, you know, I, I was figuring that might be somewhere near, you know, two thousand twenty two hundred. Well, what you see, we don't know that because it depends on how long the mortgage stays out. Right. Let's assume. Let's assume that it's three quarters of a point on seventy thousand. Uh, that would be something on the order of four seventy-five a year. Mm -hmm. Well, times ten years is four thousand times. It would be, be twelve thousand dollars over the life of a thirty-year mortgage. Right. But I don't think it's realistic to think it'll go through forty in that that kind of time. Mm -hmm. You know, most people, the more the average mortgage, I think, is seven and a fraction years. Yeah. But given that, uh -huh. you certainly get asked, oh, how far are you going to get? Uh, I just think that the, I, I, although the numbers are not without consequence, uh, it's just not enough to pursue legally. And I doubt seriously if the insurance company is going to be intimidated by a telephone call. I do wish you well, kid. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. We go to Walker, Minnesota. Hi, Bruce. Hi. Hi, I'm calling. I'm seeking advice from your fountain of knowledge. Uh-oh. <laughs> I got a, a real estate question. Go ahead. I'm a real estate baron here. I, I got a couple of rentals, and uh, I'm thinking about selling one of my units. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've got uh, a $24,000 mortgage on it, approximately. All right. I think I can get uh, oh, 34, 35 out of it. Uh, what I'm looking at doing is selling it and taking the quick, the quick 10,000, and using that to pay off some. Uh, personal debts. Well, wait a while. Are, we, do we have, are there any taxes involved here? No back taxes or anything. Not in say back taxes. I mean, when you sell it, are you making a profit? Did you do any depreciating? What? Well, I bought it for uh, 29 and I've probably got 3000 of uh, improvements into it. Yeah. So I'm only looking at uh, maybe $3,000 if I got 35 out of it. Boy, hold it. Let's back up a little bit. You paid 29 you said? Right. How long have you had it? Oh, uh, four or five years. How much have you depreciated it? I don't understand exactly. Do you have an accountant? Yeah, I, I, yes. Well, when your accountant does your taxes, he is depreciating that property every year. Right. Well, you got to recapture that when you sell it. Uh-huh. I, I can't answer that question. <laughs> don't say, uh -huh. <laughs> I'm just telling you, you got to recapture it. Right. So you're going to owe a little more taxes than you think, I think. Okay. Yeah, now the time you get done playing around with this, well, I don't know. You you may wind up with you say you're gonna sell it. You pay twenty nine. Yeah, I've got a twenty four mortgage on no, it. From the, how much the mortgage is not a, not not an issue here. All you right. pay twenty nine, thirty five, six, eight, capital gain. You probably pay about two thousand dollars in taxes. Uh huh. Well, I can still walk out with uh, eight to ten thousand dollars. All right. And I thought I thought about it. I got a, a student loan. I got four thousand. I wanted to pay off. I'm paying one hundred fifty a month on that. All right. And I could pay off uh, the rest of the car. So that's not even a thousand dollars. All right. Then I've got uh, a six thousand dollar bank note that I borrowed uh, to pay, make the down payment on another rental house. All right. And that was a that's a, a well, one year note that. Uh, well, let me see. Six thousand for the for the student loan. You said. No, four thousand for the student loan. And how much for the car? Uh, it's eight hundred. All right, that's five thousand. Yeah. And how much on this other loan? Well, this this loan is a six thousand dollar bank well, note. You're, you're I, already at, you're you're a thousand bucks in the hole already. <laughs> right. But it, it make a dent in that. And what I'm wondering is, you know, do I just go on and and uh, the student loan will be paid off in four years? Uh, how much you paying interest on a student loan? I think it's at uh, nine. That's pretty high. Okay. 
But the bank note, that's sitting there at, uh, I think that's uh, 10 or 11. Yeah, well, then a good idea to get these out of the way if you can. Mm -hmm. I'll disagree with that. So where are we going with this? What, well, I'm don't... wondering, you know, off the top of your head there, uh, should I, I can afford to pay these uh, bills. That's mm -hmm. not a problem. My income's enough to pay the bills. Uh, looking at long term, you, you know, mean to I... say you, you have enough income to pay it currently without without selling? You're talking about right, right. Well, what? Uh, let, let's go. You know, we haven't even discussed, and we only got a couple of seconds here. Let's okay. talk about the house. Yeah, it, it's thirty five thousand. What's it rent for? Uh, the rent uh, I get three eighty, and and uh, it's break even. No, 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 no. It may, it may, it may be break even. It may not be. Mm -hmm. Depending, you see, you, you got to figure the cost of your money and so on and so forth. You're saying that that you don't have, you got enough coming in to pay your bills. That doesn't make it break even because it doesn't take into account the lost interest on your investment. And it further probably does, you haven't factored in the amortization, which may be, and it just may be that this is worth hanging on to. Is the house going up in value? I have to think it is, yes. Well, no, you don't have to think. <laughs> You're going to have to do more than just have to think. You ought to talk, to talk in terms of getting some appraisals done, but it may well be if you can hang in, keep paying your bills, you might be better off doing that and hang on to the investment. Good luck. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. You haven't persuaded me that you can even make a living doing this. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, you know, you know I fly, and... I spend a little time out of my FBO, or if FBO is plural, a couple of them I hang out at. Uh-huh. Well, um, okay, wow, the uniqueness... Where are you making any money? What's that? How are you going to make any money? Okay, well, the uniqueness of it is that uh, um, it's a situation where we... One of the partners is uh, is from that area in Kentucky. Yeah. And uh, says that everyone there, you know, most of the airports around there have no service that people are really satisfied with as far as either maintenance or even just, you know, uh, tie-down service. Yeah. And fuel and all that. that doesn't sound very unique to me, but go ahead. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm not Look. trying to knock it. I mean, you're a pilot, right? Mm hmm Okay, well, I mean, you know, th you've heard these stories before. How much runway you got? How much runway? 3,200. Oh, that's enough. Lighted? Yes. Mm -hmm. You got a runway? How, how, many, how many competing FBOs are there in the area? Uh, there are several, but there's only one, and it's uh, well to the north, and it's a very small strip that people are satisfied with in the area. Why are they dissatisfied? This, this, okay, this airport is, it's about 30 miles from the closest city. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, there, right now there's no one, there's no FBO on the field. And there's what? still 22 planes tied down there. Yeah, but 22 airplanes, let's, let's assume you're getting 50 bucks a piece. All right? Uh, well, it depends on what, what time period you're talking about. A month. Oh, I'm not even worried about tie-down fees as, as, as a source of revenue. Well, where, where are you going to make your money? Maybe I'm missing something. You, got, you don't sell that much fuel. You don't think there's that much money in maintenance, huh? No, sir. I mean, there's money in it. If you can, how, many, how many mechanics are you going to keep busy? Uh, initially, two. I don't think point. you can make a living at that, no. What are, your t what, what's, are you buying this or renting it or what? What's that? You're going to lease the property? You're not going to buy it, I take it? No, we're not going to uh, what, buy what are you it. Gonna, what are you going to pay for, to lease this property? Uh, we don't know at this point. We have to deal with the airport board on that. And it will what's probably it, be county a, or something? a small minimum and then a percentage of growth. What's it, a county airport or something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe. <laughs> okay. I mean, I know guys that run these places, you know? And I just think you're giving up. And all, most of them have a, a charter service. They have rental, they rent airplanes, some of them they own, some of the airplanes they sublet, you know how that goes, you can find people foolish enough to do that. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, at least best. Boy, I just don't... Maybe so, you guys are you guys are both licensed mechanics? Mm-hmm. What are you going to do for parts inventory and so forth? Well, it'll have to stay minimal until... Yeah, so how much money you guys got to play with? Um, well, it's that's... Probably about fifteen thousand. Boy, you're working awful. I mean, I, I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm really not. <laughs> no, it but, doesn't sound that way. But, but, but I just don't want to see you lose your money and your effort. I mean, it just if this is a real good deal, how come somebody hasn't gobbled it up a long time before? How long has the uh, the FBO been empty? How long has the, the county owned this thing and they can't keep a tenant? I uh, couldn't tell you. It's been at least five years. 
you will get that for next to nothing. I mean next to nothing. I'd look it over very carefully. I do wish you well, young fellow. I'm Bruce Williams. I hate to discourage young people, but I got to call them like I see them. This is TalkNet. Anchorage, Alaska. Hello there. After all of that, Anchorage, are you there? Well, let's try Bemidji, Minnesota. Hello. Bruce? Hello there. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing real well, thank you. Appreciate all the information provided for us folks. Well, thank you, sir. <clears throat> Problem is, uh, about a week ago, in fact, it was exactly a week ago, my wife stopped in to fill up with gas, and uh, her the van was basically nearly out of gas. She kept it running while she was filling, because the uh, vehicle, huh? it was very cold. She wanted to keep it keep it warm. Yeah, you're not supposed to do that, but go no, ahead. I understand. A little dangerous, but I right. do it too, I suppose. Go ahead. Right. Uh, but as she was filling it, the vehicle began to sputter and cough and spit, and uh, she kept filling it up, filled the entire tank, and uh, basically then it just stopped, stopped running. She went in, paid for the fuel. Uh, when she came out, she tried to, tried to get started. It did run. Uh, cough, sputtered, that kind of thing again. Uh, so finally, uh, she had to call me. I went in 50 miles into town to, to pick her up. 50 miles yeah. into town? Well, wrong trip. It's, it's a long ways. We live out of town quite a ways. It would appear you do. You're really out in the booties, huh? We sure are. Uh -huh. But uh, so we, we got it towed into the uh, station the next day. Yeah. Basically, the mechanic said that we got some bad fuel. Yeah, that sounds like it. Yeah, he figured that there was at least water in it and uh, maybe some other stuff. Well, it's easy enough to find out. How's that? You take the gas and you let it settle out. Yeah, we uh, we did. Uh, this was right before Thanksgiving weekend, so we uh, we kind of lost touch. They, they didn't get it done uh, by Wednesday night, so we had to get another vehicle. Like, Without uh, regard to that, the 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 the. the, the uh... Contaminated gas, if in fact it was contaminated, is still laying there in your tank, right? Right. We did ask him, uh, or we were going to ask him to, to save some of the contaminated fuel. I don't know if that got done or not. My wife was basically dealing with the mechanic. Uh, she's nodding to me, telling me that they did save some. All right. So well, I you, guess the bottom line, Bruce, is um, how, do we, how do we follow up? And they, well, you call a gas station. Maybe they're honest, maybe they're not. Yeah, yeah. The the total is uh, over seven hundred bucks. That doesn't include the time lost. My wife's. Uh, well, time lost. I don't think you're going to get anything for. Okay. I don't know how you came. How did you? How did you arrive at that number? Uh, well, the seven hundred dollars is the bill I'm looking at right now from the service station. If that what did they charge you seven hundred bucks for? Uh, well, there's a couple hundred bucks in labor. They had a they had to disassemble the entire uh, fuel system. They took the the fuel tank off and they cleaned that out. Uh, the Injectors were contaminated. Yeah. The filters, uh, gaskets, uh, yeah. the fuel pump. Now I'm not sure that necessarily was caused by by the contaminated gas, but you know I, clearly we've got at least uh, six or six or six hundred fifty dollars. Mm -hmm. Well, have you contacted the the station where your wife bought the gas? Uh, no. I wanted to talk to you first. Oh, I gotta contacted them right away. The likelihood is, if in fact this is what caused it, it would appear that it did. Right. Now, making you know, you see, there's only one little little problem in this whole thing. You said your wife was driving on near fumes. Right. Now it's just possible you had some garbage in the in the bottom of your tank to get kicked up because you you let it go down so low. That's R right. We we thought about that too, and uh, the mechanic we discussed it with him, and he said that uh, our tank was is galvanized. There could have been some water, and she did put some de-icer when she called me, asked her to. To put some fuel line dryer or de yeah. or whatever you call yeah, it. Dry gas. Right. And so she did do that. And um, in spite of that, uh, yeah, the mechanic is convinced that uh, it was well, contaminated. I, I think that there's a strong likelihood that that's true. As I said, though, there is that possibility hmm. that she got down to the bottom of a tank and there was some. How old a car is this? Uh, it's uh, about five years old. Yeah, you could have, you could have had a collection. A junk down there, and yeah, do you do you customarily let the car go down the fumes? No, my wife likes to do that though. She <laughs> she's got a bad habit of running out of gas. Well, but then she drives that car regularly. What's that? 
does she drive that vehicle regularly? Yes, she does. Well, in that case, then that would that would pretty much eliminate what I just described. Right. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, we put a lot of miles on. No, the, a lot of miles has nothing to do with it. Right. What I'm saying is if your wife customarily lets the thing run down and nothing. Right. Then that would eliminate or oh, okay. the, 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 the likelihood that I've described of having a, a lot of debris down there. Right. And it got stirred up because, you know, she right. let it get down to nothing. And then right. when she was letting the thing running, she would splash into that. And that would be the first thing that we had sucked up into the, the fuel system. But I don't think that's the case. All right. I go back and talk to them and say, look, okay. I got some contaminated gas. And the, the overwhelming likelihood is that you have other complaints. Okay. In the likelihood that he doesn't really isn't willing to deal with us, uh, should I contact an attorney? or? Well, it's not worth an attorney's time. Okay. Well, a small claims court? Well, you, you live in a, a pretty small area, don't you? Correct. Well, I have to believe, then, that the word would get around that there was some contaminated gas. Well, yeah, he, this station had two other vehicles in the same problem, so... Well, well wait a minute. <laughs> How do you know that? The mechanic told us. Well, in that case, those are the people that, that bought the gas the same place? We're not sure of that. We don't know that. Uh, they... They were rel the station was reluctant to tell us uh, who these other people were. Why? I'm not sure why. Well, see if you could locate them, and they bought it at the same place. That would tell you a lot. Right. Or even if if, if they bought it at the same uh, at, a, at at a, another gas station that got gas from the same distributor. Right. That would tell you something. I'd go back to the mechanic, and then tell him I'd like to know who these other clients were. I won't tell him where I got the information. But in a small town, the word's going to get around pretty fast at this because people right. belly ache complain about this with right. some justification. Right. Now, would a gas station have uh, insurance coverage? Uh, Whether they have insurance or not, it's not the issue. It's responsibility. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, and the insurance only pays for responsibility. They got to have the responsibility first. And the likelihood is that if, if you got a bad load of gas, there's lots of other people floating around out there have the same problem. And if you start asking around, I have to believe that, you know, a friend will know a friend will know a friend. Good luck, guy. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talk Now. Let's go now to Cedar Rapids. Hello there. Hello, Bruce. First of all, I wish I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Well, thank you. It was and very, very pleasant. You are a great person because I would listen to you long before your airplane crash. I've been listening to you. I'm concerned about filing bankruptcy. Oh, dear. What's the problem? Well, I was involved in a robbery. Someone tried to rob me on a property where I was delivering. I'm a truck driver. Mm -hmm. He knocked me down, broke my jaw in many places can't work now and we're almost up to a hundred grand in medical bills and i don't have health insurance oh my gosh a hundred thousand <laughs> i've had surgery three times and my I, the, I actually had two questions for you but my main question was do i declare bankruptcy or what do i do well first of all are there any victims funds in your state well this happened in california and they say that there are victims funds or victim rights yeah to people and i did file for that but i have not heard anything it's been uh, about two three months now well have you not inquired again of them i've called them and they say well we're going to get to you we'll get back to you it's just that everything is backed up and they don't say anything on what's going to happen and if it doesn't happen well then i've got all these medical bills yeah. with no way to pay for them I hear you. And well, so in that case, I'm you know, scared, to be honest. I know, I, I can understand that. Um, were you, were you, what are you, a self-employed trucker? I was, till today. I sold my truck today. Mm. Which let, leads me to my other question. I know you're not an attorney, but you own a lot of businesses. If someone would commit a crime on one of your businesses, like what happened to me, Hmm. Is your business responsible for me? Well, I don't know what your what your relationship with the business was. I was delivering food as an employee. No, I'm an owner. I was an owner operator. Well, and you, you'd be an independent contractor, right? And I, I was have... delivering like to a grocery warehouse without right. mentioning yeah. any names, of course. Yeah, but I would have no, I would have no responsibility for you. Okay, that I guess was my other question. Anyway, I don't mean that unkindly. No, but that's you know any more than. If the uh, UPS driver has a problem when he drives up, okay. that's you know he's not my responsibility. I'm buying a service for him, from him. Us, right. my, you know, we we have independent truckers deliver stuff to us, right? And we in turn 
uh, have stuff delivered by. Yeah, I mean, because we're forced to hire people to unload our truck. And we're forced to use the people that are hanging around their property. And Why the guy, you, no, hold on. Why are you forced to hire people? Because they're union. And we're told if we don't hire these people, that they'll get to us when they can, and then you can unload your own truck. But otherwise, you can hire these people that are on our property. The guy that beat me up was this guy that I hired. Why did he beat you up? Because I had to get changed to pay for the amount of money I agreed to pay him, and he didn't want to wait. So. And for this, he beat you up? That's correct. And he took what was in my pocket, which was a $100 bill. But uh, do, do we, did we prefer charges against him? Yeah, he's in jail for assault, and I'm waiting for that to go to court too. So I was wondering, since what happened to me, what you know, besides declaring bankruptcy, I guess is what I'm going to have to well, do. I don't know. Did this happen on on? Where, where, did this happen on private property? It yeah, it was at a grocery warehouse. Private property, right? And this guy was there at the, was he, was he, what, he shaped up? Is that it? I don't know what you mean by that. Well, I, he's he on just, their property, yeah. and we're told that we have to either hire these guys or we unload our own truck. And because of other medical reasons, I can't unload a truck anymore. So I hired the guy, and we negotiate a price, and he unloads the truck, and then he expects to be paid. And I told him ahead of time I'd have to get changed. And he, I guess, flew off the handle is the best way to put it. Mm -hmm. And I got a broken jaw, and I can't work now. And I'm just concerned, with, like I said, one was about filing bankruptcy, and two... Yeah, I would, I would consult an attorney to see if there's some liability in the part of the, of the warehouse people, if, they, if the, the owners of the warehouse, if in fact they... Had this guy around? Do you, do you know if this guy had any history of violence? No, he has no record of any kind. Hmm. That's unfortunate. Yeah. But uh, would you? I mean, I'm not asking you to tell me what to do. But does it sound like I, my best thing to do yeah, would, it would be to appear so? But not yet. Not yet. No, because you may have some other bills that come out of this thing. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate your help, and I always grand in medical. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. A hundred thousand in medical bills. That's correct. From a broken jaw. Yeah, I had surgery three times, twice in Sacramento, yeah. and like I said, I won't mention w w any places or anything yeah. outside of that. Um, but how much was the surgery? The surgery was close to the doctor bill was uh, five thousand dollars in itself. Well, where's the other ninety-five? Well, I had surgery twice in Sacramento, and he told me when I left the hospital, the room was $1,500 a day, and I was there seven days, plus the operating room, plus intensive care, the anesthesiologist. We're I, still not even getting close to a hundred grand, though. Well, then I got a doctor's bill back in Wisconsin, where I live. For? For intensive care, operating room again, and a doctor's bill, anesthesiologist, and that was another close to 30. But 30? Yeah. And I don't have any health insurance of any kind. How come you didn't have any insurance? I'm just curious. Me and me Stupidity. Hmm. It's my own fault. Okay. I I had never been sick before. Mm -hmm. Never been in a hospital before except for minor things and thought, well, geez, I'll, I'll never need it. And, hmm. well, <laughs> I guess I sort of screwed yeah. up. Well, it takes a man to admit that he made a mistake. Oh, I made a big mistake. But, um, again, why can't you drive? You have broken jaw is serious, but why does that mean you can't drive a truck? I have flashbacks right now. And I get dizzy. The doctor thinks in about another few weeks I should be okay and I'll be able to drive. And I'll drive for a company. And I found a company that will hire me. Mm -hmm. But he wants me to wait a few more weeks. Hmm. So... Well, I sweat it out as long as I can, but I suspect that the bills are as high as you described, that you're going to be a candidate for Chapter 7. Chapter 7, okay. Yes, sir. All right, I appreciate your help. All right, kid, good luck to you. Thank you, Bruce. I, I do wish you well. Yes, there ought to be some justice there somewhere, though. Gee, I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Dayton, Ohio. Hello there. Hi there, Bruce. How you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. A uh, big fan. Listened to you for a long time. In fact, you've done a couple of interviews with my brother on a local affiliate up here. And Is that so? Yes. What's your brother's name? Uh, Mike Sento. Yes, indeed. Uh, so anyway, I have a... 
My problem seems very small compared to the last gentleman, but... Yeah, it's not a hell of a thing, huh? I'll tell you. Um, my company approached me. I'm an hourly employee. Approached me uh, a month or so ago and said uh, they had made a... Over the course of 13 months, they'd overpaid me uh, $2,650. And I was just wondering, somewhere in your business ventures, if this has ever happened to it you? Sure, or... it surely has. I over, we overpaid. I, this is a terrible admission. Yeah, I, I hate you for all this, huh? <laughs> but we, well, I'll tell you how it happened. We, okay. I'm, I'm going to be a little general, and you can appreciate why. Sure. We are. I own a business where tips are a factor. I own several, as a matter of fact. And I think about it, where tips are a factor, uh -huh. and you have to add the tip. Let's say the, the guy makes a dollar. You have to add in a, for the percent, whatever he makes in tips, uh -huh. just to compute the Social Security, unemployment tax, and the rest of it, right? Right. Okay. And then you should, you should subtract it out. Uh -huh. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sure. So you'd, you'd show a dollar earned plus 10%, if that's the number they gave you, a dollar right. 10, and then Social Security times whatever the factor is, the unemployment, whatever the factor is. Uh, let me see, there's uh, then the, the state tax, whatever that is, right. and then you deduct the dime because that dime you never saw. Sure. We didn't deduct the dime for almost a year. Wow. So we overpaid everybody by 10% for a year. Uh-huh. We ate it. And the company's was, kind of putting the uh, strong arm on me to make a decision about how I want to pay it back. Well, frankly, I thought, I don't, I, if I were they, I would eat it. I uh -huh. did. Right, we're, uh, uh, and a lot more than you. Well, of course, I don't know how many other people they did this to. None. Twenty six hundred. How big a company? Uh, the, I work for a fairly small company. The company that owns this is over a seven billion dollar a year company. <laughs> well, I just think they had to swallow that one. Okay. I just wanted to get your opinion. Well, that was kind of. I didn't have it. I didn't have the nerve to go back to the employees. I know. I now it kind of aggravated me to be candid with you because I think they could have said something. Sure, and and I was in kind of an odd situation. I changed shifts. It was where I'm a union employee. It was contract time, so I lost shift differential, but I gained money on my uh, contract negotiation. And I thought it all kind of came out of wash. Where if I'd have investigated closer, I would have seen that I was being overpaid. Mm -hmm. But you would think a company of this size would... No, but what do you mean? A company of this size, all it takes is one employee to make a mistake. Right. right. What, what happened was I changed jobs and they paid me my old wage um, in my new job where I would have been making less money. Mm -hmm. You mean but, within the company, you mean? Correct, correct. The job description, I guess, is correct, what you're talking about. Correct, correct. In my case, just stupidity. That's what I think. I mean, I mean, I just made a mistake. Yeah. And when you make a mistake, I, I my attitude was we eat it. Okay, I just but want to I, get your but, opinion. Whether, but I don't know that legally that's that's correct. But I, I think that in this case, they had to just say, well, we made a mistake and we'll, we'll correct our records. I do wish you well. I'm sure a lot of people disagree with that. But I know, as I said, in my case, we were just downright dumb. That's what came down to that. All righty, we're going to Michigan, and I can't read my... Taylor, Michigan, hello there. Hello, Bruce. Thank you for listening to my problem. Well, you're very, very welcome. I appreciate you calling, my friend. What's up? Um, I'm in the military right now, and I'm getting out in January. Yeah, what do you do? I'm, uh, I work at nuclear power plants. Right now, I'm a recruiter, though. Uh-huh. But that's my Navy specialty is working on nuclear power plants. <laughs> and you're the recruiter who's leaving them the, the, the troops, huh? Yeah. Okay. How do you explain that to the recruits? Well, I won't be here next month. I try not to bring up the issue. I hear you. <laughs> Go for it. My uh, my concern is uh, I I have a job lined up at a uh, at a steel mill, mm -hmm. but it doesn't pay very much, and it's, it's just general labor. I'm I'm not really going to be utilizing my training or anything. Mm -hmm. How so long were you in the navy? Pardon me? How long were you in the Navy? Um, eight and a half years. Well, then you're not retiring then, are you? No, no. Right. Okay. And what, I, what I'm contemplating doing is, is uh, going to college. Good. How old are you? 26. All right. You're the same age as I was when I went to school. And I'm married. And so was I. And, and I'm, what I'm thinking about doing, and my wife's supporting me, is going to college um, full time and just taking a part time job and, and uh, basically throwing away this job that. Uh, that I have lined up. I disagree with that. I think okay. you ought to go to school full-time and work full-time. Do both at the same time? Yes, sir. Is it possible? Well, I sure as hell did for five years. Really? Yes, sir. 
And would, if I can do it, dummy like me can do it. Certainly, you can do it. <laughs> I don't want to say that. <laughs> what do you? Um, what do you? I can take a full load and work full time. Well, I certainly did, as I said. I'm not the only. I mean, let me tell you, I'm just one of millions have done it. <laughs> I worked on with the school, and at that time was well. Of course, I, I have to, to to admit that by the time I was like a second semester junior, I was pretty much of a conniver mm -hmm. and could work my schedule out. You know, where I could play with it a little bit. Right. When I began, I used to get eight thirty classes and three thirty classes. I see. I drove a cab from initially my first year and a half or two years of college. I drove a cab from four in the afternoon to four in the morning. Wow. Except on weekends when I drove from four in the afternoon to eight in the morning. Wow. You're my hero. Not a hero. Hell, I had to eat. <laughs> my wife was pregnant. Oh, wow. You were married too, huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was married. I was a veteran. Mm -hmm. I was a year younger than you were. I was 25 when I started as a freshman. I was 25 and a half now that I think about it. 29 when I got my undergraduate degree. Wow. So I can do it. Oh, sure. I and mean, listen, there's no, no hero requirement because you know who the beneficiary was? Me. Right. Absolutely. It was, I, I paid for my stupidity of not getting it out of the way when I got out of high school. As are you. Right. Paying for stupidity. But I went right into the to the military. Well, I went to the Air Force. Yeah. Same thing. Right, but it, uh, that wasn't stupid. Well, my opinion, what I did was stupid. They had a war and I couldn't let them have a party without <laughs> me going, see? You know, they, I finished high school, I think, on the 18th or 19th. The next day they decided to start a war. I mean, the, the great, my, my sense of timing, man, is better than anybody ever met. I mean, I can, I can think of thousands of things in my life where my timing was exquisite, you see. And I figured, out oh, this thing will be over in a short time. Well, it wasn't over by December, so I enlisted. But any event, no big thing. Uh, I, I probably should have, you know, I had a football scholarship, but much better off to go play football. Right. Instead of mess around going to the Air Force. But the point was I paid for my foolishness. Right. And you're going to pay for yours. And it's got to make up for it sometimes. And it's a very, very, very inexpensive payment when you come right down to it. You'll be under 30 when you finish. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it's, it's a little bit tough on the family life. I mean, being disingenuous sailor-wise. Right. You know, your social life uh, is diminished geometrically. But who cares? Right. you got plenty of time for that. Plenty of time for that. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I do wish you well, Tiger. Knock him dead. Yeah, the, and this business said, well, congratulations, you did it. Nonsense. You did it for yourself. You did it for your family. I was the beneficiary of my stupidity, and I was the beneficiary to some degree of whatever industriousness uh, I exhibited. This is Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. New Orleans, Louisiana. Hello there. Yes, hello there. Good evening, Bruce. Hey, how are we doing, guy? Uh, we could do, be doing better. What's the trouble? Okay, this is what's going on. I have a direct mail company, and I'm a, a solo operator. What uh, are you selling? I, I'm sorry? What do you sell? Uh, direct mail. I just What get, do you sell? Or what do you mail? What, what I mail out are just coupons and advertisements that my advertisers I get see. together. I get maybe 30 or 40 uh, different businesses to go into a tabloid newspaper. Mm -hmm. And then they just go ahead and promote whatever they want to promote. And they can offer a coupon if they want. Excuse me. Or they can insert a menu that they have or their own flyer inside of the tabloid newspaper. I see. Um, what, I, what happened was I had a, a, a client of mine who went ahead and gave me two checks that bounced. One of them I didn't know bounced because... Uh, when it came back to my box, it came back three or four weeks after it was actually mailed uh, by the bank back to me. And the reason that that happened is that uh, it first went to the wrong box, uh, my post office box. Mm -hmm. So it, there was a long gap yeah, in between. The, the, the guy sorting it dropped it in the wrong box and it laid there for a while. Exactly, because the other person didn't check his box daily or periodically. Yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I, I had one check for $525, the other check for $250 that also bounced. And I went ahead and figured, well, I've, I've had one or two people over the last two years that have bounced a check and I redeposited it, never mention it to them because I'm sure that they are embarrassed by it. Mm -hmm. And it clears. So I figured, you know, that was just a, for whatever reason, that it bounced. It does happen. People right. do, and, and pe some people write bad checks inadvertently, and others write bad checks. Exactly. And that's the, the problem. I got this guy who gave me the two checks. It's almost $800. And uh, I confronted him about it. Actually, when I went to go see him after I tried to get it deposited for the second time, I said, uh, he, he told me, oh, did you 
get uh, one of my checks back. And then mm -hmm. I said, yes, What a I surprise. Did. He knew damn well you did. Exactly. Exactly. So we only got a couple of minutes. Where are we going with this? Okay. Well, what I wanted to know is uh, he had sold his business. And uh, he had told me, can you uh, please wait until I sell the business where I'll have the cash to pay you. And um, I, I, I said, sure. I mean, I didn't know what else to do. I couldn't really do anything. But the goods had already gone out the door. And what I wanted to know is, since I, can know, I can't even get in touch with him, I have no, no idea where he is, can I go to the new owner and say, look, here are the two checks, here's the, the depends, invoice? That depends. If the guy bought the business, the answer is yes. Okay. But don't assume just because it looks like he bought the business that he bought the business. Okay. Anybody who is smart does not buy a business. You buy the assets of the business. It's called an assets-only arrangement. Okay. Just for the reason that you described, so you don't have any hidden liabilities. Mm -hmm. But if it was a business, a corporation as an example, and he actually bought the corporation, then he's responsible for the obligations. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, but I, I was waiting. I just wanted to talk to you and, and find yeah, out. But, for... it, but, but 99 times out of 100, if the guy has half a brain, mm -hmm. he didn't buy the business. Okay. He only bought the assets of the business. I got gotcha. But that's something that, that any attorney can find out. Okay. Which way the thing was uh, was put together. And, of course, the other guy, if you want, if you can't find him, what's well, a different program. But, uh, you know, issuing a bad, it's called uttering, a bad check is a crime. And you can, you can prosecute him. You can go out through the collection process. If he doesn't make it good, you can prosecute him for committing that crime. And tell you the truth, I'm more inclined to do that these days because uh, people just write bad checks when they think with impunity. And there's, you're only going to stop them. You just let the word get out. You mess with that sucker and uh, you may have a record. Dallas Regan has got a record. Yeah, a very good one. Uh, spinning the dials and making this thing work very, very nicely. Ted Snyder in Master Control, and Mr. Paul Hill as Operations Manager. The redoubtable Dan Rudd, our producer. Good guys to work with, they really are. Hey, it's not easy, kids, I know that, but too good. Hello there, WDBO Country, Orlando, how are you? Fine, how are you tonight? Okay, baby, what's on your mind? I bought a dog um, in April. What kind of a hound? It's a Yorkie. Yorkie, ter Yorkie Terrier, is it? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And um, she got sick in September. And uh, we found out that uh, she has a very um, bad liver. Mm. And uh, they won't give us any um, expectations on our life. Mm-hmm. And I just wondered what recourse we had and how to approach the breeder. Well, I'm not sure you have any recourse. Is this something that the breeder could or should have known? This is, no, it's not. Well, case, I understood under the Florida um, lemon law that there was uh, a possibility that we could at least get our money back. A lemon law for an mm -hmm. animal? She, has a, she was born with this. Yeah, this but, is something that would not show up immediately. Well, that, that, that's my point. As I said, how can the breeder be held responsible for something that they were not aware of? I, mean, I, I sympathize with you losing your pet because I know how that is. I've been down that road, and I can hear in your, the pain in your voice. But as far as being being reimbursed for something that they didn't know, I don't think that's reasonable. I mean, you bought the animal what eight months ago, something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, how long can a, can an animal be guaranteed or warranted? Well, I don't know. I've had places that have. Um and I bought them at the pet shop that they'd guaranteed them for up to a year. Well, first of all, I wouldn't buy an animal at a pet shop. And in shop. fact, I bought one one time that had a 10-year guarantee. A 10-year? Yes, she had a 10-year guarantee. What kind of an animal? It was a Yorkie. Ten, ten she had a 10-year guarantee. She, a, a she passed away when she was 15, but I still have her, I still have her on records, and it says they're 10 years. Take a deep breath. A guarantee against what? Things just like this. That's very hard to... Well, I mean, I'm not questioning the... the, the, the <laughs> no, I have it you. on file. It's well, out I'm there not, on my that, file. That, I can't imagine how anybody could give such a thing. Well, they did. Well, you can certainly approach them, but if, 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 if I were the breeder, under the circumstances you've described, I, I think I'd have to sympathize with you, but that's where it would end. Mm-hmm. 
well, you know, we might have found out sooner if um, we'd had blood work done. Yeah. But how many people do blood work on well, puppies that are normal, you know, act I perfectly normal? don't disagree with you. And if you'd found out earlier, so what? The same, the same my same, um, my position remains the same. How can the breeder be held responsible for something they had no knowledge of? I don't know, but on the other hand, um, how can the breeder continue to breed dogs that have congenital problems? Does that mean every pup would have this problem? And is it no, passed by the sire? There's but, but a, it, a possibility. That, well, but then you're not going to, would it be, first of all, is it passed by the sire or the dam? We don't know. Well, does the, I, I just think you're on very weak ground here. It's not that I'm not sympathetic, but I think you're on weak ground. Mm -hmm. And if there's somebody out there that wants to correct me, I'd be willing to listen. You can listen to the radio. The number is 703-413-8381. If you're a dog or an animal aficionado, I'd like to hear from you. It's 703-413-8381. I, well, that's just my opinion, but I, you do have my sympathy. So I know what it's like to lose a pet. Old Mickey the Mutt here is a, a very close friend of mine. His predecessor was uh, well under Mickey's age when he went to his reward. On very untimely death. Grand Rapids, your turn. Hello. Grand Raps, hello. Hello. Hello there. A little lag in the line there. Yeah. Um, I just want to thank you for your show, like everybody else seems to. Well, you're thank like you, a, sir. What's on your mind? You're like a financial MacGyver. <laughs> well, you seem to know useful information instead of how to turn pipes into bombs and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> MacGyver, of, I, there's an analogy I've never heard. Oh, well, good. Holy I'm smokes. Uh, well, let's cut to the chase here. Yes, sir. In 88, I was divorced, and in the process of haggling over all our goodies, uh, I got to keep my retirement money in my company, and my ex-wife got to keep my house. Mm -hmm. I have a quick claim deed and all the divorce paperwork saying I'm not entitled to any of the proceeds. Or well, you mean you, like you, you don't have a quick claim. Rather, you executed a quick claim deed. Uh, well, I signed one. Yeah, that, well, that, 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 okay, that, what I'm trying to get to is it. The, your your term was a little, just a little inappropriate. Had your wife executed, you would have. You executed, she's got. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, my problem is that the mortgage holder is in Indiana. Yeah. I'm told by them that they are not obligated to follow Michigan divorce law. So Absolutely. Absolutely, talking. positively, without question, and also unequivocally. Well, I'm kind of wondering how I can get my name off that mortgage. You can't. I can't buy a house. With a, you, you cannot. With that showing against me. You can't, unless oh, it's paid off. That's terrible. I can't force her to sell or anything? Absolutely not. You could have, you could have when you were getting divorced, not now. Uh, you see, you have to look at it this way, I, it, and this is not going to be comfortable for you, but nonetheless. When the lender loaned the money to purchase that property, you guys were an item. Yep. Now, it may or may not be that they took both of your incomes into account, but they certainly took the fact that there were two bodies involved. Okay? Correct. Now, given that set of conditions, the fact that you get divorced is not their problem. And the fact that a judge says, you get this and I get that, is not their problem. That does not in any way diminish their, uh, I don't want to use the word hold, but um, that doesn't diminish your responsibility to them. Now, what you did was you executed what is called a quit, Q-U-I-T, claim D. You gave up all of your rights in that property, but you have absolutely no right to waive your responsibilities without their acquiescence, and they are not going to do that. Nothing in it for them. No kidding. No. Nope. You're on the hook as long as the lady wants to live there. Well, she's going to be there for quite a while. She married somebody who declared bankruptcy just before they married. Oh, lovely. Unfortunately, that's, what, seven to ten years before they pull that off your record? Ten years. Oh, gosh. Yikes. So, so you're going to be sitting on that on that uh, bond until oh. such time as the property is sold, and I don't know any way, whatever, Short of, you know, something she does voluntarily, gratuitously, or buying her, buying her off. You know, saying, hey, I'll give you 10 grand if you sell a place, something that order. 
But uh, that's what quick claims are all about. And it's unfortunate many divorce attorneys don't explain that to their clients. Hi, Bruce Williams. This is Talk Now. I have a dog breeder in Cincinnati who is going to comment. So the, the thrust of the thing, the lady said she bought a dog eight months ago, and there was a congenital problem which just turned up. She feels that the dog breeder ought to come up with some money. It was my position that after eight months, I didn't think so, but I'm willing to listen. Hello there, Cincy. Uh, hey, Bruce. Nice to talk to you. It's a pl Thank you so much for joining me. What's going on here? What's the, what you tell me? Okay. Uh, in my opinion, uh, I've been breeding dogs for years now. Mm -hmm. Most breeders, even without a contract that is reputable breeders, will give you credit towards another animal after eight months uh i do it i've done it for up to three years have you really? five years well see well, I how can you afford money. to do that because i love my dogs i i well, don't I love my money. dogs too mm. well bruce i've been breeding for several years now and i didn't make it i made one dollar after the six litter mm. Boy. Uh, i love my breed mm -hmm. and what breed do you have i breed chinese sharpays oh my a very trendy little mutt uh, yeah, I just got a litter of seven on the ground, and I, there's no way I'm going to come close to breaking even on this one. Is that right? They, they, they are, they've come down a bit in price, have they not? Yeah, but the problem is, is most people oversell them, and I don't. Well, what, what do they sell for now? I oh. sell mine for about three to three fifty. Yeah, they were up over, what, a couple of grand for oh, a while. I've, I've sold puppies to local, the breeders locally for $500 each. They turned around and sold them for 2000 Yeah, I, tell you, I remember when Sharpays were the, the thing to have. Right, but most breeders, like I will, on, on a congenital disease problem like that, okay, I put a good guarantee in there. Mm -hmm. And most breeders will say, hey, thanks for letting us know. Here's a credit towards another animal. Um, that's very generous. I'm you know, that's, I mean, that's just the way my contract is, and that's the way. What uh, about this 10 year deal? Goes. What about a 10 year stand shit? Is that possible? In my opinion, no. Um, I mean, I've heard. There was a few pet stores that were trying stuff like that and doing stuff like that, but if you read through the fine print, you know, there was just no way to meet the obligation. Well, I'd be uncomfortable buying a, a, a dog from a pet store anyway. Right. Well, that's my, I mean, I try to tell people don't buy from a pet store. Puppy mills and all that sort of thing. I'm, right. I don't plus, approve of that. Plus, they try to buy it from me and then they mark it up four times. Well, I don't care if they mark it up. That's not the issue. The issue is that you frequently find animals that ordinarily would not be sold and there's a whole bunch of good reasons why right. I'm, Plus, I'm, I I'm not anti you want to buy your fish you want to buy other stuff but i just don't believe puppies belong in pet stores right well when i sell them also i don't sell them to everybody and mm -hmm. that's a big misconception i mean when i had it when i sold my last litter i turned away 50 people because i didn't think they'd be good homes well that's <laughs> you know you're a better man than i gunga dean but, yes, I mean, she should talk to the breeder, and okay. they may be able to help her. I right, listen, I appreciate your comments, and if I'm dead wrong, and it may, may, I may well be, I, uh, I'm i very happy to be corrected. Thanks for calling. Have a great holiday, my you friend. You too. Madison, Wisconsin, your turn. Hello there. Mr. Williams, it's a pleasure to speak with you. Yeah, thanks so much for your call. I have a pretty straightforward question for you. I, uh, I had my car legally parked in a parking lot. Mm -hmm. The car was hit. And there was about $300 worth of damage, I'm guessing, to the front bumper. Uh, the, Just to the bumper? Pardon me? Just the bumper? That's right. it? The way, that, the way the car was hit, um, the, uh, the bumper where it wraps around the front of the car was, was hit by the front of her car and pulled away from my car. But no damage to the fender. Mm-hmm. So anyway, we okay. Are we talking about a new bumper or having to repair? Probably repair. Uh, it'll have to be a new bumper. It's it's pulled right away from the frame. Mm. All right, go ahead. Anyway, I uh, I got her insurance in information mm -hmm. and called her insurance company and made a claim against it. Mm -hmm. uh, she claimed that her car suddenly lurched forward and it was that's nothing she did and that it that uh, not, that's it might, not material might have been a problem with the car anyway it doesn't matter it has nothing to do with you the fact is that her car caused damage to your car right so uh, in talking to her insurance company to uh, set an appointment set up an appointment to bring in my car for them to uh, make an estimate mm -hmm. of their own uh, they claim that, that her insurance company claimed that uh, they're pursuing uh, the fact that there may be a latent defect with her car well that's their problem that doesn't okay. that, that doesn't diminish your claim against them. Okay. Well, that that is the gist of my question because uh, her agent told me that I may have to pursue the car's manufacturer. Nonsense. You pursue her. 
Okay. You just go now. Uh, how old is your car? Uh, my car is a nineteen eighty seven. Well, in that case, you're not entitled to a new bumper. Okay. You're entitled to a used bumper in great condition. Because okay. you had a you had a used bumper in great condition. <laughs> That's right? fine. You had a seven year old bumper. I mean, exactly. I, I I would question whether they should put a new one on there. No, but, I, I but, just, but they should be able to go down to a salvage yard and put a bumper on. And I got news for you: if you hit her with a summons, they are not going to screw around for three hundred bucks. They're going to pay you. Okay. So if they don't, if they if they want to give you that nonsense about the manufacturer, you tell them just fine. Thank you very much. Boom, small claims court. Name her. They have an obligation. You see, whether they like it or whether they don't, they okay. have got to defend her. Right. It would be cheaper to give you the three hundred bucks than to try to defend her. Okay, well, I uh, I just didn't want to walk into their office and uh, not know what I was talking about. If you just say to them, this is the claim, she hit me. They start giving you that, run around, you say, thank you very much, and you don't argue. You walk around, and you go right on down to small claims court and file a claim against her. It has nothing to do with the insurance company. But her contract with them says they have to toddle on down and defend them, defend her. For oh. 300 bucks, they are not going to blow an attorney. Oh, it doesn't okay. pay. Thank you so Particularly much. Particularly when your car was at rest and she right. hit you. I do wish you well, guy. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure. I'm Bruce Williams. Hang in for more. Oh, yes, before we take this little time out, I had to tell you the Christmas elves in the studio this evening. Yeah, Mr. Dean Everett twisting the dials. I understand that that little hat is only worn this time of the year. Dallas Riggin, he doesn't look like Santa Claus, but they're Dick Owen. I mean, he is a natural. And, of course... Our Chief Elf, Dan Rudd. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Hello there, Cincinnati. Welcome to my world. Howdy. Howdy, bub. My question for you, Bruce, is uh, uh, my the company that I work for is uh, uh, working for a state institution. And That's cool, but your company does work for a state institution. Well, actually, right now, we are contracted. We're actually subcontracted to do some work in the state institution. Can you mean like, oh, like renovation work? Something well, it's, it's telecommunications work. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> we are subcontracted uh, with another company who then in turn is, is contracted to do the work with the state institution. Mm -hmm. In the contract, it states that the people from the original company and then the subcontracting company, which is us, uh, are supposed to be making prevailing wages. Is that, uh, this is a federal deal of some kind? Uh, well, it, it's a state uh, deal. The reason I ask, prevailing wage is generally speaking a federal matter, not, it could be a state matter, but it's generally a, fail, a federal matter. Is that not true? Well, I'm really, I'm not sure. I, I, I did see the uh, paper that had the list uh, because I know it goes by experience. And I did see the list of exactly how much that you would make, you know, if you had one year, two years, three years, so on, uh, yeah, on this particular yeah, but, job. But you use the word prevailing wage. Mm -hmm. And that is generally used when you're bidding or when you are, are, yeah, bidding a federal project. You have to pay prevailing wage on that job. And you okay. know that going in, so you, you, you bid accordingly. Okay, but also you're supposed to then pay the workers a certain prevailing wage amount. Well, that's what prevailing wage is. Right. Well, my, my problem is um, I've been told by, by my company that the prevailing wages is determined not by how much total years experience that I have no. in the field. It's, it's determined by the prevailing wage, the average wage paid for that thing in unions in your area. That's what prevailing wage is. Well, see, what it is is they go by, let's say that, you know, you have five years experience that may pay, throw in a, a number out, that may pay $15 an hour, yeah. prevailing wage. What they're saying, though, is that uh, your five years experience does not matter. It, I don't think it does. In, in, at least in the federal uh, example, I don't believe it does. Well, see then, okay. A bulldozer operator, they, there is a prevailing wage in a given area. And that's what you have to pay your, you know, you pay them more, but you cannot pay them less and bid the federal contract. Now, there may that you, it may well be that your state also has, uh, you know, uses a prevailing wage uh, um, 
requirement. Yeah, and I'm, I'm pretty sure they do. Okay. But it's not predicated on you as an individual, I don't believe. It's, well, see, what, the, it's the, what the job requires, not well, what... See, the, the, uh, the, the list that I've seen as far as that have the, the, the figures as far as the hourly wage that you would make uh, for what, what it was based on was how many years experience that you had in the field. Now, you know, whether or not my company then uh, did the job uh, accordingly as far as with prevailing wages, I'm, I don't know. But I'm trying to get to it, and I could be dead wrong. My understanding is that uh, a, a Zinco operator, the prevailing wage in a given area is so much an hour. It is not predicated on that guy. It's the job. Uh -huh. So if you had three jo three people with different, for the sake of discussion, uh, experience levels, if this is the job, they'd all get paid the same. Well, actually, that's not the way that this is set up. Okay, maybe that, that's my understanding yeah, of prevailing it, wage. Right. That's not the way that this is set up. It, it, in other words, there is a certain minimum amount that you make for certain years' experience. And see what yeah, is happening. That's, all, but that's with your company, right? Well, actually, that is with the state institution. They gave this paper, okay, to uh, the original company that we were working for who in turn then gave us a copy and said, this is what they're supposed to be making. Okay. If they I'm have so many guys. years experience. Yeah. Now the other, the other guys that, that is on the job has less experience, of course, than, than what I do. Uh -huh. They are making the prevailing wages. Okay. I was told that. Are that, you getting paid the same as they are? No, no. You're paid more? Yes. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Well, yeah, it, it, for some reason, it, 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 it goes by years of experience. All right, for whatever. So what is your beef? Well, the, the, the problem is, is they're, they're, they're telling me that I cannot make a so-and-so amount for having, you know, three years experience. Mm -hmm. what, what it is based on is, is that the first day that I entered the job, which was two months ago, mm -hmm. that... That's when your experience started. That's experience what with your company, is that it? That they're saying that, that we will pay you uh, for for two months experience because that's when you started doing the job with the state institution. Well then is, is that the criteria? This is it well, experience with the state or is it experience overall? I mean I, that was my question. Well, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I don't know that anybody outside of your state could answer that. Okay. And the wage and hour would seem to me the appropriate place to make that kind of inquiry would be the wage and hour division yeah. in your state. Well, I, I have a call in to them, and, and they, they haven't called me back yet. Mm -hmm. I thought maybe you might know. Well, no, as I said, it, it, it varies dramatically from jurisdiction to jurisdiction yeah. in the state uh, example. Now, the Fed is the state is the same all over the country. But the but the uh, prevailing wage is not the same all over the country. Right. But yeah. the but the application of the law is the same. Yeah. And by the way, it excludes relatives. Well, see now the original company. Uh, what they are doing is they are basing it on years of experience as well. They've. Well, they, well, I think what we have here is a is a, is a difference of interpretation. Right. Now, I don't know so, who's right so or wrong. If if I went to the. Uh, I guess the the wage, uh, the people that handle that wage and hour. Yeah. Uh, I guess what if, if they interpret it as being okay, and I tell them my situation, and yeah. they say okay, you know, you are supposed to make according to your years of experience. Mm -hmm. They side with you is what you're saying. Right. Okay. Then I in turn can then give the information to to my company, and then they would have to back pay me, and then. Mm -hmm. uh, I say after they fire you. Yeah. Could they do that? Could they? Yeah. Why not? Not for I, that. I don't, not for know. that. I, not for that reason. But there's no way you can go through a day without breaking a rule. Right. None of us can. I mean, well, just, that'd be pretty bad if they did that. Why? Uh, it, it just. I. I don't know. I you guess. see, you know, under our system, everybody admires a whistleblower, but everybody hates him. Well, see, that's my. That's the problem. You know, you ask people, you should people, been. you ask people, I've done this on the program here. You say, well, if, if someone is doing something wrong, should you blow the whistle? Yeah, you should. That's your responsibility. Next question, would you hire somebody who did that? Absolutely not. Well, see, we're not talking about a couple hundred dollars. 
back pay. What are we talking about? We're talking about $1,000, right around $1,000. How much do you like your job? Well, <laughs> I, I, I like it a whole lot. How much do you want to stay with that company? Pretty much. Now, I bet, no, wait, 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 don't get on with it. you got to make a decision. Do you want to stay with this company or do you not? Yeah, I, I would like to. Well, if you go blowing the whistle, i got news for you. You're going to be history. Well, see, I wonder if I, if, if I couldn't... Uh... I, I I understand what you're saying. That that was a fear of mine. That doesn't make it right or wrong. Right. Probably wrong, but that isn't the issue. We're talking the practicalities here, the realities well, of the business world. I wonder if if because uh, it, it, it's a smaller company. And, and you're going to tell me what would happen if they came in anonymously or whatever. Well, what what would? Well, I'm not wanting to uh, <coughs> put in any kind of a, a complaint. What, what if thing? I presented to them the information and said, now, you know, I'm not going to, you know do anything about it except I want you to see the information the and I, more, they, if you present that to them they have an obligation to, to investigate they don't give a damn about your sensibilities or the companies yeah and do you think the company's not going to figure this out that you're the guy I wonder okay see I, I'm just wondering if I shouldn't then talk to, to the company but, how much do you earn a year yeah. oh gee uh Maybe 18 to 20. All right, so you're talking about 5%. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's it's something, though, that... Uh, I'm not telling you you're wrong. Yeah. How You sound like you're pretty young. How old are you? 23. Yeah, you are young. Nice disease to be suffering from. <laughs> but the fact is that you may as well learn that the realities are, yeah, you can be right. It's right rather, I, I, I've used this analogy so often, but tuck in the back of your mind. If an 18-wheeler is bearing down, and you get the green light, and a big old little man there says, walk, and you walk out in front of that truck, you are going to be right. Dead right. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. We go now to Portland, Maine. Hello there. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Oh, uh, hello, Santa Claus. How are you? This uh, is Santa Perry from Portland. What's on your mind? Well, I just wanted to share with you a couple things that I do. I'm an entrepreneur. I've called you a longtime listener and a few times caller over the years. You've given some great advice. I've also put my caller uh, call waiting block on so we don't get interrupted. <laughs> All right. Um, a suggestion to some of the people that are out there that might be operating out of their homes as I do with Santa Claus, which is a once a once a month business. Once a month? Once a, uh, once a year. I'm oh, okay. One month a year. There okay. we go. Um, what I do is I have through my local phone company um, a service called Ringmate, which gives me, without having to purchase a separate line, costs me $6 a month extra, and I get my business listed as that company name. I have an identifiable ring as well as an identifiable ring for my home number. Was it a ring from the beep, 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 it's a home phone, of a boop, 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 it's a, low, it's a business well, call. Well, you get one, your normal ring I choose to have is my home phone. Mm -hmm. And then it goes, bang, bang. And I'll be doggone, I have not heard of that. That's my, uh, I have actually two businesses. I run a kosher grill, the only kosher restaurant in Portland. <laughs> <laughs> a and, kosher, uh, wait a minute. Kosher a, Santa Claus. <laughs> a kosher grill and Santa Claus. Isn't that a little bit of a... <laughs> hey, Bruce. Bruce, didn't you know Santa Claus is Jewish? <laughs> Who else are you going to get to work on Christmas? Oh, boy. So I'm a Jewish Santa Claus. I run a kosher grill in the summer and the fall up here in Portland. Uh -huh. And what I do is I have to be very professional. It's the first thing my customers look for when they call up and I answer, hello. They say, wait a minute, is this Santa for hire? And I'm, sh and I'm like... Well, yes, it is. So what I have to do now is they call in on the Santa for hire number, and I answer it on the, it goes, ring, ring, ring. I get three rings. So right. that to me is ho, ho, ho. And I answer, ho, 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 Merry Christmas. This is Santa. <laughs> and then when I call well, yeah. on two rings. Well, you have a combination on right. Yeah. <laughs> and then when I call on two rings, I'll answer, you know, Perry's Kosher Grill. How can I help you? Is that right? And then if I get one ring, hi, this is Perry. What can I do? You have all three businesses, or two businesses coming on this separate deal. Two businesses. What is, how, many, how many different rings can one get on one line? You can have a total of two ringmate numbers on a line, huh. plus your home phone number or your regular business number, so Turns you can actually have three numbers. Outstanding. Happy I holidays, Bruce. Hey, the very same to you, and Santa. happy Hanukkah. Thank you so much. Thanks. Hey, it's been fun, kids. Now, I know it's not easy, but give it your best pop, huh? 
Of oh, course. Sure. Okay. Now I understand what you're talking about. Sure. Generate some income. I have I have thought about that. And it, once again, if you dart out 20 minutes out of the city, you can find some duplexes. Well, right what the heavens? A 20 minute, a half hour commute is nothing in today's world. True. Nothing. Then. No. End of story. It's nothing. You may not like it, but it's nothing. Half an hour, 45 minutes is nothing. Right. Each That's way. the average commute, according to the Wall Street Journal, is 45 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Well, if the Wall Street Journal said it, it must be true. We know that. Well, that's an accurate <laughs> source, nonetheless. <laughs> Only kidding, you know. But, um, you know, the thing that I had uh, was if getting into some sort of proposition, living closer to campus, you'd obviously have a greater selection of, of more uh, amiable uh, either roommates, if buying a single house with three bedrooms, or um, in the case of a duplex. But I don't agree with that. I don't agree with your premise. I suppose it would just merely include those that do not have cars. Well, drive. how many people in today's world don't have cars? Quite a bit on campus. But I, I, I can I can see your point. It would seem to me that what I've told you makes just absolute sense. We're not talking about a lifetime purchase here. We're talking about a rel it could be a relatively short time purchase. Yeah. But mm -hmm. for a, for a, for a guy who is single at twenty five to buy a home and occupy it exclusively in my opinion makes no sense and the roommate thing really doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense you're far better off to go into a straight business arrangement where people have their own quarters and you rent them those quarters True. and as a practical matter you can control with the same amount of income a much more uh, expensive piece of property which ultimately accrues to your benefit True. I wish you well kid thank you sir Hi, Bruce Williams. Hang in for more. This is TalkNet. Bay City, Michigan. Hello there. Hi, Bruce. This is Mike. Yes, Mike. What's on your mind? Well, thank you for all your worldly wisdom each evening. Well, thank you, Mike. So I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Well, I am involved with a company that uh, offers a 401k, mm -hmm. and uh, I am right now putting in 6% of my annual salary. Mm -hmm. And they match right up front 3% of that, plus a little bit more if the company 3% does 3% of that or 3% of the salary? 3% of my salary. Well, that's 50% of that, then. Correct. Big difference. Yeah, there sure is. Okay. Okay, I have an opportunity with that 401k to up that to 12%, even though the company won't match any more above uh -huh. can that. You, can, can you spare the money? I could spare the money so right now. Stop right there. Okay. Boy, oh, it's, it's, you're, you're, you're sheltering... An additional six point. Even if the company made no contribution, mm -hmm. it would still be a good deal. Is it? Yes, sir. Uh, that's what I wanted your opinion well, for. Because you're like... going to have money working in there mm -hmm. as just track it to how old are you? Uh, I'm 32. All right, let's track it. Let's say you're going to have, uh, well, I'm going to say 30 years. I'm going to let you retire at 62. For It's a real easy equation, all right? Okay. Let's take a buck. Mm -hmm. We put a buck in that 401. Now the dollar is going to be the, the dollar earns for the sake of discussion six cents, right? Right. Ordinarily, you throw two cents of that back to those so and sos in Washington. Mm -hmm. But you don't do that, do you? No, I don't. It stays in there. All right. That two cents is now going to earn interest for the next thirty-two years. What are we looking 30, at there? Thirty years. Mm -hmm. Well, depending on the interest, you know what the rule of seventy-two is? Yep. Well, just divide it out, whatever the interest is. Let's assume it's nine say eight percent. Nine years, the two cents becomes four cents. Yep. In 18 years, it, the, the four cents becomes eight cents. In 27 years, the eight cents becomes 16 cents. And the other three years, we can figure something on the order of certainly a nickel. Uh -huh. So you got 21 cents that you would have sent to Washington that you got working for you. Or put another way, you've increased the money, ten, the original investment tenfold, and it didn't cost you a dime. Okay. What is wrong with that? No, it sounds really good. What I'm really curious about, though, is when I do turn the age of retirement. Yeah, who knows what that'll be, first of eh, all. True. Be it's realistic. It. We don't know. <laughs> no, you're laughing, but yeah. I mean, they're over, and I think they should raise it. Boy, I'll get I do, too. Because but, uh, when they made the magic number of 65, you know what the idea was? Mm. Serious, do you know? No, I have This no is idea. back in the 30s. The idea was most of the people wouldn't live to be 65. Oh, yeah? That was the idea. They're going to die. Well, people... And that, well, wait a minute. That was true, taking the actuarial tables of the 30s. Mm -hmm. Well, 65, hell, you just, you just start to chase young women in, you know? 
<laughs> Isn't that true? Okay, so you guys and, and and your generation is going to live even longer. Other things being equal, if you if you if you can control AIDS and a couple of other things. So, given that set of circumstances, why wouldn't it be appropriate to raise it to seventy or even maybe a little older for retirement? Now, I got a lot of people, young people, excited. Why the hell should I work till seventy? Because you're going to live longer. Because I wanna. Well, I hope so. <laughs> but, you know, then that's where they, we get into this real nonsense about women and uh, being discriminated against because they get a lower pension. Well, that's nonsense. They should get a lower pension because they live on the average of 15 years longer. They're going to get more out of it. Absolutely. Right. They're going to get a whole lot more out of it. It's not discrimination. It's just taking the, the realities of life. It would be great. I'd, I'd let me extend my life 15 years, and, uh, you know, and I'll, uh, I'll uh, give up part of the pension. Or put it another way, it's going to drop for women because women are doing all the stupid things that men do. They're dying of, of strokes and whatever that they didn't, yeah. they didn't do before. All the stress. You know? Yeah, but the point is right now, actuarially, you're going to live longer than your dad. Mm -hmm. It's just because of, the, of, of all the things that are happening in our world. What a, in a 401k, we also have the option of putting in contributions after taxes. What would be the benefit of that? Because the money is going to work in a, in a tax-deferred environment. Okay. That's what, you've got to be kidding me. What's the, do you have an IRA? Uh, we have a couple. Well, the point is, right, right now, if you put money into an IRA, it's got to be after-tax money because you already have a pension plan, right? Okay, yeah. But does it pay to put it in? Is a oh. cat got whiskers? <laughs> Bear sleep in the woods? Come on. Of course it pays because, again, the money that that money earns is going to be tax-deferred for over a quarter of a century. Mm -hmm. What a hell of a deal. Yeah, it is. Well, I thank you for your help. Okay, guy. Have a good evening. I'm going to give it my best shot. Hey, and speaking of this evening, Dan and I are going to be hanging out. Yeah. We're going to be talking to you from 10 p.m. through 3 a.m. Eastern Daylight Standard. I wish it were Daylight Standard Time at 800 743 8000. Now, the commercials and the news and the rest of that, for obvious reasons, are done later. So the, the uh, programming goes very quickly. We'd like to hear from you. That's 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. Eastern Time at 800. 743-8000. Salem, Virginia, thank you so much for your patience. What's on your mind? Good evening, Bruce. Got a couple of questions for you here. Yes, sir. Uh, we've got an adjustable rate mortgage on our home right now, and our rate just adjustable. Just adjustable? Yeah, to 8%. <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, I can lock in 9% for the last 20 years of my, my mortgage yeah. and cut two years off my mortgage. I don't know if it's worth it or not. What do you What think? do you mean cut two years off your mortgage? Well, I've got 22 years left to my mortgage now. Yeah. So I can go to a 20-year and raise my payment like 25 or $30 oh, a month. Oh, I see what you mean. Well, how, there are a couple of things here. You got the, you just had an adjustment period. How often does your mortgage adjust? Every year. And what is it you, what, what is the, um, the, well, first, what's the max, but two, two, two and a half? Two and six. All right. Six but, over the life and two. Well, we're, well, well, wait a while now. How far into the six are we already? Uh, we started at seven. And you're only one into the six. Right. So you can go to 13. We can go to 13, that, yeah. That's the max. Worst yeah. case, Jimmy Carter scenario, 13. Yeah. Why do I say, why did I say Jimmy Carter? Well, scenario? probably the same reason you would have said the other guy. What other guy? <laughs> what is it there now? No, I wouldn't do that. Why did I say Jimmy Carter? Well, because the interest rates went sky high. When they went to 21% of their Mr. Carter now in yep. 19, the late 1970s, if memory serves me. Yep. 21%. Woof. Ah. Okay, so what I'm trying to get to is you have some protection now. On the other side of that, I think most people, at least in the short term, think the rates are going to go beyond 9%. Now, next question is, you're talking in terms of 20 years, but what are the, uh, what's the likelihood of you staying in the house for 20 years? Fairly good. Is it really? Yes. In that case, my inclination would be to lock it in. Okay. Because I think you're going to see next year 9%. Now, when, how? What, let's let's but let's talk about this just for a moment. How, how much is the mortgage? Uh, Forty-five thousand. No, that doesn't. We're, we're screwing around with pennies and nickels here. The reason I, I said that: Can you make this adjustment any time in the next twelve months, or is there a window? Well, see, I can't convert it. I have not the, the the. Well, I thought you'd make it converted to nine. Well, I was going to convert it to another institution. I oh, can't well, that's not a conversion. Now, wrong term. That's not a conversion. 
I can't convert it with the people that I've got now. Well, you're not converting it. You see, we're, okay. into, we're into semantics here. You're going to apply for a new mortgage. Right. There's a big difference. Right. i got to do a whole new mortgage. Yeah, but do you understand what the differences are? Yeah, I've got to pay closing costs. got to go through the whole spiel again. Exactly. And on top of all that, you see, if you had a conversion privilege, you could stick around with 8% for 11 more months and then convert. Yeah. But you don't have that. Right. How about the company you're with now? Will they offer you a fixed rate? Uh, yes, they will. At what rate? Uh, same. I, well, then you go with them; be a lot cheaper. Well, you, but still, I got they, they can't convert my mortgage. They don't have an office in the state that I'm in, so they can't convert. Well, look, what I'm trying to get to: if you stay with the same mortgage company, it may well be, for example, that you wouldn't have to get new title insurance. Okay. You wouldn't may not have to get a new survey. It'd be a lot cheaper to stay with the new company if it can be a co or the, old, the company the old you're company. with now. Okay. It can be a, well, at least explore the costs involved. I think you're going to find it be a lot cheaper. Okay. Good luck, guys. Now I got one more question. Oh my goodness! Uh, I'm looking at starting a company in in, in Salem here, mm -hmm. uh, making bunk beds. Hmm. Uh, it's a very lucrative. It looks to me like it's very lucrative. The guy's got all. He's done all this homework. He's what guy? Uh, this company that I've I've sent off for information. Oh no! Somebody's going to put you in the bunk bed business. Put right? me in the bunk bed business, right? Yeah, what, are they, what are they doing for you? I want to go about a minute and a half. Okay, here. for five hundred dollars, they're going to give me an operations manual, a video, drawings, materials list. Uh, plans, jigs, templates, uh, right. ad slicks, yeah. camera ready art. The well, whole the, the last things I think are not going to mean too much. All right, let's assume that you can build bunk beds. Okay. How are you going to sell them? Uh, I can sell them through ads in the paper myself, or I can wholesale them to places that sell mattresses. Well, what makes you believe the places who buy mattresses are going to want to buy bunk beds? Well, I've already you? talked to a couple of them, and they seem to be they seem to to want to do it. Well, I seem to want to do it. I mean, and, and do it is two different things. Exactly. I know. Exactly. How did you get the name of these places? I uh, was looking through a woodworking magazine. No, I don't mean that. I'm talking about the names of the mat. The, the oh, I just people. just out of the phone book. Okay, then they were okay. That's, that's a good answer. Yeah. In other words, they weren't some names they provided or could manipulate. Right. They're right here in town. Who is the the, the mattress place? Yes, but I'll, I'm trying to get to yeah, is I'll the sell here, I'll sell the bunk beds here locally. Yeah, I understand okay. that. What I'm trying to say is that that's a good approach as contrasted with calling somebody they told you to call specifically. That's I understand. not the case. I understand. Well, 500 bucks certainly isn't a great deal of exposure. Uh, the only thing that I, I think you want to be very careful of, and this is uh, the kind of thing that can really trip up the novitiate, is don't underestimate your costs. Okay. If, if somebody else is charging a dollar for something, and you figure you can sell it for 50 cents, get very nervous. The strong likelihood is that they did the, the appropriate calculations and you made a mistake. Not always, but that's the strong likelihood. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Our clients feel wanted, needed, because they are. And that's true with you guys, too. I mean, you are my customers. People send me, they'll say to me sometimes, hey, Bruce, you know, that guy was on last night was stupid. Said, Wait a minute. Wait a minute. He may not have known about for the sake of discussion, how to figure out a mortgage. But man, that sucker can drive an 18-wheeler and back it into a spot with an inch on each side. Can you do that? Point is, we all have our strengths and our weaknesses, but I don't, can I can't excuse business people. Let me give you, this is kind of a long way around the barn, but some years ago, I was very tired, as I frequently am when I, I did a show someplace, and I was going somewhere else. I was in an airport, and I was waiting for the bus to go to the to the uh, hotel that I was going to stay at that evening and then go on to another airplane the next day, which is not an uncommon thing for professional travelers. And I'm standing out there and standing out there and standing out there. And I got a little thing from my then business manager tells me what hotel I got to go to. And the guy, just the, the bus isn't coming past. Or at least it wasn't coming past the place where I was. Finally, I went inside and I'm, I plug a quarter into the... Into the uh, machine into the telephone and I call the information operator and uh, wait, wait, wasn't necessary to put the money in but I put the money in and I sleepily said and I think it was holiday in but it's really not important uh, I said can you give me the uh, phone number please of the holiday in at O'Hare and the lady hesitated and she said I beg your pardon and I repeated she said mister you're in San Francisco <laughs> 
I was. The bus stops looked the same, and the little you know, the tracks out in front looked the same. Walk over here for the courtesy bus. I don't even remember what town I'm in. Okay. Embarrassed, I asked for the Holiday Inn in San Francisco at the airport, right? And she gives me a number. I call, and the guy says, oh, yeah, uh, our courtesy bus goes to the dither and yon, and this is where you pick it up. I go out there, and sooner or later, the uh, the bus came by, got in the, in the, into the, uh, the bus, went out to the hotel. As it turned out, there were two holiday inns at the airport, and I'm at the wrong one. The guy picks up the phone, and he calls, and he, and he says, look, uh, Mr. Williams is here, uh, not at your store, so they cancel it. And they were separate franchises, it turned out. Uh, they canceled the one, raised the other. That was the end of that. Talked to a young fellow this afternoon and says, maybe you can help me. He said, a couple nights ago, I had to go to Dallas. He said, I called the information operator, got the number for the hotel. I asked the, the guy who answered the phone, are you the one opposite the whatever to play? Some landmark that if you were from Dallas, you'd understand. Yep, there's the place. So he makes a reservation, guarantees it with his corporate American Express card and shows up. And uh, he's, you know, this I, I'm so and so walks into the, you know, the reservation clerk, and he said, "Yeah, it's you. well, yes, sir, go right upstairs, swap." Next day, he gets a phone call, Mr. So and So, uh, we are charging your uh, your American Express card because you didn't show up. He said, "What are you talking about? Didn't show up? I was there last night." No, you weren't. Turns out that the operator who had given him the information operator gave him the wrong hotel, same name two in the same town, and the clerk said, oh, yeah, this word a place. Now they want to charge him as a no-show. He is not a happy camper, understandably so. He calls the hotel where he stayed, and they said, uh, no, he called the other hotel back, asked for the manager. Hey, I'm sorry, you didn't show up. That's the end of that. He called the corporate headquarters, and they said, well, these are franchises, and after all, we can't tell them what to do, which is a that is a load of garbage. If anybody tells you that, it's a load of garbage. The guys, given the franchise, have a great deal they can do. They can put pressure on their franchisees and never lose sight of that. Don't ever accept that. Well, they're independent business people. Nothing could be further from the truth. Yes, they're independent, but the franchising company can put a great deal of pressure on their franchisees if they elect to do so. As it turns out, these two competing franchises of the same operation are in a you-know-what kind of a contest. They're sticking to each other. Interestingly, he talked to the manager of the place he stayed. Nothing's happening. He finally called back, and he, the manager wasn't there. He got an assistant manager, a young woman, and she said, well, of course, Mr. So-and-so, if you're having this problem, we will cancel the charge on the room you stayed in last night. Bingo. Corporate can't do anything. The manager can't do anything. But a young assistant manager said, we have been trained to be certain our customers are happy. Now, when it comes right down to cases, where are you going to stay next time? And the next time. And the next time. In the hotel, it said, screw you. You made a reservation. And even though you didn't stay here and you did stay in town and you stayed at the same kind of a place, we're not going to credit you. Or would you go back to the place that said, yeah, you stayed here. But the reservation was over there. But the point is, you're unhappy and we're going to make you happy. We'll hassle it out with the other guys. Bright young lady stupid manager and incredibly stupid corporate incredibly stupid hey it's a competitive enterprise the hotel business right you know, they're looking for customers and you know this young fellow's gonna tell this story a hundred times i would for me i'm telling it now yesterday i was asked to make a phone call for for a friend and make a train reservation i forgot i forgot you know yeah i have a credit card and that kind of stuff and then and it was a problem in that regard. Two o'clock this morning, I wake up. Two o'clock in the morning. Oh, Lord. I, I call, Well, it's a good time to call uh, Amtrak because nobody else is calling them. So, so I got through pretty quickly. Got hold of a young fellow. His name was Larry Brown. Larry Brown out of the Philadelphia area. Couldn't have been more accommodating. Stays on the phone with me about 10 or 15 minutes. And unhappily, the, uh, the, the reservation that they want me to make, they, they were full up and he explained to me, hey, I'll share this with you. He said, if you call at 5 o'clock in the morning, a little after, that's when the conf when the uh, uh, reservations that are canceled are cleared out of the computer. That's a good time to call. You might pick up a, a, a vacancy that wasn't here at night. I said, boy, I better be on a hell of a good shot for me to get to 5 in the morning. In any event, he went on to give me another telephone number. I called there and I explained what I was trying to do and who I was and so forth. And this 
Young woman got very, well, you call reservations. I said, look, I call reservations. They sent me over here. Well, you have to call reservations. I explained, look, for the third time, if I wanted reservations, I know how to call reservations. They were kind enough to give me your, well, I'll put somebody else on you can yell at. I wasn't yelling. Being a little firm, perhaps, but not yelling. Well, the wind up was, she puts on a young lady named Pat Kelly from Amtrak. And understand this, Amtrak has no competition. Nobody else is running passenger trains that I know of. Pat Kelly, could. 10 minutes later, she calls back, Mr. Williams, how are you? Hey, we got lucky. I got a cancellation for your friend. But open, open, open. Now, who would you do business with again? That first bimbo that was so vicious and mock off, or, the, or her supervisor, who was obviously much more intelligent, more articulate, more accommodating. I keep trying to explain to people, and I read this in my book in Business for Yourself, you never win an argument with a customer. Never. Yeah, you may win the argument, and you get 30 seconds of joy. You lost a customer forever. Forever. If someone wants to explain why that's good business, I'll be delighted to listen. But I think it's industrial strength stupid. Hey, we're going to be here tonight from 10 p.m. through 3 a.m. Eastern Time at 800-743-8000. You're invited to call 800-743-8000, 10p to 3a this evening. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. <laughs> Frederick, Maryland, hello there. Hey, Bruce. First time uh, caller, long time listener. Did, did you know that my friend Dan Rudd, he is my producer? Yes. Did you know that he was an acupuncture specialist? I could probably use some right about now. A little he, nervous. He just keeps giving me the needle here. <laughs> What's on your mind? Uh, I got an interesting dilemma. Um, I've got a uh, bank problem with a, an IRA account. Mm -hmm. And... Um, What's I'm trying to invest it into three separate IRA accounts. What does that mean, a bank problem? Well, um, if you, I'll explain the problem and then we'll go from there. Um, what I've done is split the money for the three separate IRA accounts in half and been trying to draw from the current money market and invest it into the three funds. Run that by me again. Um, the money is in a current money market at a bank. Oh, at a bank. Correct. Is it, when you say money market, that's true. Banks have money market accounts, but they are not money market funds. Well, it's a money market IRA account. Okay. Now, is there some kind of a time limit on that? No, no time limit you know, at You all. can take it out, put it in whatever you want to. Correct. Right, um, so. It's a very low interest rate, and I sat on it for about a year there. I said, I got to get off this money and invest it. All right. It's about $16,000. All right. Um, so... Uh, I picked out three separate IRA accounts, and um, what do you mean you picked out three separate IRA accounts? Well, you know, um, you mean places that you can put it? Yeah. Well, that okay. I, I, I'm not trying to pick on you, but the terms are kind of important. Well, I'm you're, young, you're looking, and um, it's uh, first time I'm. That's okay. I'm not, I'm not picking on you. What we're saying is you're looking for new depositories. Correct. And you found three places you want to put it. Correct. How much money are we talking about? Sixteen thousand dollars. But how much? Yeah, but yeah, but sixteen thousand. And I was going to divide that three three ways into the three funds. Equally, we're pretty near equally. Correct. Five thousand bucks a fund. They're round exactly. Numbers. Okay. Now, why are you having a problem? Well, um, I made one mistake. Um, Only the first one. two I did, I divided by thirds. The first two, five thousand and some change. Yeah. And then 533, the last one. Thirty-three. Thirty-three. Say again? It should be five thirty-three thirty-three. Correct. And some change. Well, that's it, exactly. Right to the penny. Well, if it's sixteenth, well, it doesn't matter. Go ahead. No. And then the last one I said remaining balance. Okay. And of course that application got there first, and they got the whole wad. <laughs> All right. But now it gets interesting. A little more interesting. Um. So now I went in, and um, the other two, um, weren't getting any action well, and, there, was no, there was no action to get <laughs> well correct but um the bank is still telling me i have sixteen thousand dollars within the account oh that'll that'll clear you sixteen thousand already been transferred right correct so don't worry about it well no but seriously you said don't worry about it the bank will make the find their error and they'll backtrack and correct all the interest accrued and so forth and that i mean it's been about two weeks time and it might take them six months correct really yeah. So they, don't in my it. case, I, I, seriously, I, I, I mentioned this many times. It was a year or two ago at this time of the year. We were doing intercorporate transfers. 
Okay. You know what I'm talking about. Moving, Not, one, moving money from one company to another for tax purposes. Okay. It was $130,000, $40,000 that we moved from one company to another. No, it's just, just for tax reasons. And I called the bank. I, I got a statement. I said, look, that money's gone. No, Mr. Williams, you're wrong. I'm, I'm telling you. I, I know. I could, no, Mr. Williams, look, you got that hundred and thirty grand. Well, course, what, you just forget it. You don't do anything. Well, what happens now? I've talked to the other funds, and they said they will resubmit against. No, no, now. no, 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 no. That's not what you do. Well, that's what. I don't I, give a damn what they told you or what you told them. That is not what you should do. Well, they're gonna. I, I need to tell them not to. Then that's because. right, because you have no money there. Okay. How can they resubmit on a zero? What should be a zero balance account? Okay. They cannot. Is that true? Well, I mean, I saw on the computer today. I went in and got a. All right, let, let's do it this way. What's your first name? David. David. But well, how do you look in stripes, David? Stripes is in. As in prison. Uh, not very well. Well, then, 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 then listen to me, Dave. Well, that's why I'm you are you. What you're doing is you're, you are knowingly overdrawing your account on money that you know that you don't that doesn't belong to you. Correct. Well, you, well, correct? That's a crime. Now, they could be, you could get off because you're being stupid, but that's still a crime. Yeah. What you should do is go to the money fund or money, whatever the, 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 the depository was. We're, who got the 16 grand, Right. Yeah. And tell them to take it out of that account. Okay. End of story. Okay. You don't take, don't screw around with a bank because I the money, is, the money's not there. And it'll take, it'll sooner or later catch up. And sooner or later it'll catch air. up and bite you right in the butt. Okay. Absolutely. Alrighty. But I mean, just, I mean, you, you just don't get tempted. Well, it's like hitting the lottery all of a sudden, but I knew. No, it's not up like, no, later. hitting the lottery, it's your money. Not even close. This like, is, hitting the lottery is your money. It's not your money. Yeah. Not unless you want to go to Brazil or something. Uh, I don't think 16. I don't, I don't think 16 grand going to get you very far. That's right. Just for a couple days. <laughs> okay, kid. All righty. Take good care. Tampa, your turn. Welcome to my world. Hey, Mr. Williams, I have uh, a couple problems for you. Yes, uh, sir. Number one, let me give you a quick background on our situation here. Me and my partner are both 26 when we started the company. It was about a year and a half ago. Let's take a deep breath. Okay. What kind of a part of a business do you have? Um, we uh, started a business based on an invention that we invented in the medical field. We work in microbiology. Okay. And we invented uh, a specimen collection device. A specimen, like a like a new kind of specimen bottle? Yeah, more or less. More or less. Well, actually, more than less. That's exactly <laughs> what it is. Okay. <laughs> that we needed to get it going and have a, a mold built. Okay. There's three parts to the product, so we needed three molds. All right. We have those. Okay. Um, obviously, we're inexperienced. Well, the potential for the, the product is in the millions, multi-million. Is it really? Why? What makes it so different? Um, it's used every day. And well, that's nice. It's a disposable product. Nothing wrong yeah. with that. I'll give you yeah. that. It's disposable, and there is no... Um, is it dramatically different from other specimen bottles? different well is it different yeah, enough yeah, it for me to change if i were in, in 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 the business of collecting urine specimens is there is it different enough that i'd say gee we ought to use that one instead of the one we're using yes absolutely As a matter of fact the reason we invented it was out of um Necessity? Uh, frustration because the, the ones on the market now weren't getting the job done let me tell you that you you are that is the, the whole story necessity is the mother of invention <laughs> and no i'm serious that's a it's an old saw but it's true you saw a need because you were there in the marketplace and it wasn't doing a job, right? Correct. That's the best way to go. Well, so far everyone seems to think so. Okay. Let's assume that the patent can be granted eventually. Well, our attorney believes it will. All so right. he says he can't obviously guarantee that. Hey, no, of course not. Hey, you're doing real good. I want you to hold on just a minute for okay. I have to get a little behind in my obligations, okay? Mm -hmm. I should remind you before we take this little commercial interlude that we'll be here this evening from 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. at 800. 743 I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Tampa, Florida. Hello there. Okay. This is our problem, Bruce. Um, we have, there's three major distributors in medicine. Big, yes, sir. The, the big boys. And we've approached two of them. One of them, more or less, hasn't called us back yet. Right. The other one, the other two have, have received this 
with open arms, um, one more than the other, and we're going to strike a deal with them in 96. That's what is it that you want them to do for you, this distribute, not manufacture? Correct. Not package? Well, the one company that's going to distribute for us um, thought the product was good enough and solved one of their problems so much that they wanted to bid on the rights to produce it for us, hmm, which we nice. allowed them to do, and right. they have placed their bid. All right. Um, so, so far, we, it sounds to me like you're going to be some wealthy young fellows here. Well, if all goes well, it's the plan. Um, <laughs> That's the plan. Cut me a break. Um, the um, that case going out to, to our club in Nibor City and spend some money. No, I'd love to. Go ahead. Um, the company is in Pittsburgh. I know you're, you talk about that a lot. So yes. You're probably familiar with. Well, it. we got a club there too. Um, they they are going to do it, but we've missed their deadline for their catalog, so we have a, a year and a half here that we're going to be in limbo. You're kidding me. The, they, they, the only way they advertise is in the catalog, don't they have? That's uh, kind of the medical business. Um, there isn't commercials. There's no radio. So. Oh, I understand that, but I mean, do they, do they they have do they have men that detail men that go out and sell? Sure, but well, for the first for the first year, they said they would do that. They'll develop a uh, brochure for it. They'll go out. Right. They'll sell it. Right. But until it hits the catalog, you won't see an increase in sales. Well, you'll see. No, I, I don't think that's true. You'll see some sales. You won't see the big hit until it hits the catalog. Um, what we're our dilemma is this: we have another company that's interested in the product also. Yeah. And in the, in the interim, what we'd like to do is, um, well, what they'd like to do is buy manufacturing rights from us. But only for the interim period? Well, no. Uh, right. I would suspect it would be for, for a year. Well, no, wait a minute. I, I don't think so. No. What makes you believe they're going to go out and just grab something for the, for the short term, knowing that you're going to take the, 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 the big enchilada to this other company? They'd be crazy. They're promoting their competitor's product that they won't have control over. And, and, and I frankly, unless you tell them, sooner or later, somebody's going to cut your throat. Well, we did tell them. Okay. We told them that. They're well and aware the, of it. And they're gonna, you're, you told them you're going to well, take it away from them in a year. This is, this is the deal. With, with the company in Pittsburgh, yeah. they're going to use another product with our product. And the company in Florida here can use our product with a different tube attached to it. What I'm trying to get to is the company in Florida is going to get stripped in 12 months and the product goes to Pittsburgh, right? Is yeah, that true? But, not that easy. Well, I wish we had more time, but I don't know that I want to give it to somebody in the interim period, and I think they would be very, very foolish to do that. They're promoting another guy's product in the long term. Good luck. I'm Bruce for TalkNet. Traverse City, Michigan. Hello there. Hi, Bruce. Getting a little drafty in your part of the world, isn't it? Well, I pushed the snow two days ago, and I had to get up this morning and push it again. I mean, oh. it's about eight inches here. And... Did you really? Yeah. Well, yeah you're, yeah, you're really up there in the northern part of the state. Well, it's, it's good for a lot of people, but... <laughs> it's great in the summertime, I suppose. Oh, it's beautiful, fishing, and everything is beautiful. You know, there's the three months out of the year you can't beat it. <laughs> that, that is some recommendation. What's on your mind, guy? Well, Bruce, I want to say I'm retired. I've got 40 acres with not much of a house. The, the land is worth more than the house. I've got, I've got a lo large brother that wants to buy it. He's got a house. I'm, I'm out of town. Well, let's, let's slow down now. Okay. you got 40 acres in the house. How much is he offering you for this? 75. Is that a good price? Uh... Yeah, I, I guess well, it's pretty... Well, well, you can't guess. Do you have any idea what it's... That's that's less than $2,000 an acre. Well, um, part of it is, is uh, not buildable because of, because of the EPA and the DNR, you know? No, I don't know. What do you mean? Well, it's, it's uh, what they call wetlands. I know what a wetland is. Well, uh, uh, Wetland is worth, virtually worthless. Well, okay, I got just a little over half that's... Are, are probably two thirds is not wetlands, or one third is wetlands. Mm -hmm. so, the point is, the point is, you see, it would seem to me, it would have, that you'd correct me if I'm mistaken. Sounds to me like you don't know what the property is worth. You're guessing. Well, I've, I've had, I haven't had appraised in the last two years, but before that, I, I did have appraised, and at one time I, I had the man come out no, for it. Two years, if you had it appraised two years ago, what did it appraise at? Um, they said 67. Okay, so it's in the ballpark. All right, go ahead. And and this is uh, 75 without any real estate commission. Yeah, well, but it's in the ballpark. Go ahead. Okay, he he's got a house in town. He wants to sell, but he's got he's redo redoing the house. Yeah. Um, 
He wants to give me $2,500 earnest money. Yeah. Hold the house, hold the, the deal until April. Then uh, he's going to give me $25,000 down. Yeah. Um, uh, more. And then what? And then he wants to uh, more or less just make monthly payments for no, four. It's not more or less. What does he want to do? He wants to give me uh, uh, monthly payments yeah. for four years. Yeah. And then he figures he'll have enough uh, money that he can go to the bank and and uh, to, like balloon payment do me pay me off. All right. He want what he, the, the, what he wants to do is is he wants you to, to, to he wants to buy an option from you. Yes. Till April for twenty five hundred. Yes. Then he wants to give you twenty five thousand dollars down. Yes. On a and then he will you will give him a mortgage. For the balance of round numbers, in this case, uh, forty-six, forty-seven thousand dollars. Yes. Uh, but he will pay you as if it's an old, it's a longer-term loan. Yes. And then, in the end of uh, forty-eight months, there'll be a balloon payment due. Yes. No, well, so far, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you, you have no mortgage. No. Nothing wrong with that deal. How, what interest rate are we talking about? Eight and a half. Well, that's what, that's not unreasonable. So far, it doesn't sound bad. Is a uh, that. That, that would be like 30% or, yeah, third down, you know. Well, some of that order. But we're, but we're talking, in, 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 now, you're going to have an attorney do all this for you, I trust. Yes. Not in the back of an envelope or something. No, no, no. I, I'd go with attorney. Then then there's only one other. I, it's, I don't think it's a catch. I'm not worried. The, the, the man is just him and his wife. They both work, and, and they're not kids, but they're good, you know. Well, he wants me to release two acres. At, at the time we execute the sale, because he wants to build a, a duplex. I don't have any problem with that. Two yeah. acres, of, the prices your quote be at two acres, only a thousand bucks, two thousand bucks. So what difference? Well, that? when you take the road frontage, I'm figuring uh, five, seven thousand for two acres. You know. All right, even at that, I wouldn't worry too much about that because you got a twenty-five thousand dollar down payment. Yeah. I wouldn't worry about that too much. That I, I don't think that's a problem, as long as you got enough. It's not destroying the value of the rest of the property by giving up this this uh, two acres. No, words, no, that's over in one corner, all by itself. Yeah, but I'm in terms of I'm, in term, I'm talking in terms of frontage and that sort of thing. Right. As long as that's not a problem, I don't have any problem with that. Okay. Well, I, I hear you say you're very skeptical on contracts and that, but I, I mean, who said kind? I never heard about contract. Well, isn't this a land contract? No, sir. What did, I, did I say? I don't. Did, what was the last? Let me run up. Did I say that land contract? No, I, I didn't. I'm mean, just listening to you in, time, in past times. But I never mentioned land contract. They said you're going to carry a mortgage. It's a fee simple deal. Well, I don't understand that part of it then. If you went down to the bank yes. and you borrowed money against the house, yes. you have a mortgage. Is that correct? Yes. Well, you're the bank. Okay. You're going to give a mortgage. It's not a land contract? Boy, is, a tuna, is a tuna fish sandwich a, 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 a motorboat? No, sir. No. And a land contract, you could do it on a land contract, but I think that would be foolish. It'd be even more foolish on his part. Less foolish on yours. No, we're talking about a mortgage, a fee simple mortgage. Okay. Well, do you understand what I'm talking about or not? Yes, I do understand it, but I didn't realize that an individual could give a mortgage. Absolutely. Of course they can. Anybody can give a mortgage. Okay. As long as they have property that, you know, that there's property that, that uh, well, let me, can be appropriately mortgaged. Let me ask you this, then. Is, is, is he protected or am I protected better with a mortgage than a land contract? I believe you're, you're a better position than a mortgage. It could be argued. He is not protected in the land contract at all. It could be argued that you are in a better position in a land contract because it is easier to foreclose, and I'm not going to argue that position too, okay. too, too hard. That's that's you know, and if you if you want to go that route, I'm not going to Indian wrestle you. Yeah, I would. I, if it were me, I'd just go fee simple, let it go. But I mean, there, are, there it could be argued that the one advantage to you under a land contract, he misses one payment, wham, you can foreclose it well, a lot more quickly than a regular mortgage. I, the way I understood it, I, I'm, I'm not. I don't want to get into that. I want to go that far because I. I well, know, what, no, what were you going to say? Pardon? What oh, were I was you just going to say that I thought that in in some states, if um, 
they could let their payments go for six months and then they can catch them up again. And, and you know, when you go to foreclose, they say, well, here's your money. And Well, that's true. But you can you can start foreclosure a good deal more click, quickly with less paperwork involved on a land contract than you can on a mortgage. Okay. Because the property you see never leaves your name. Right. Under a land contract. But but he okay, but he can but he goes to court out and registers it, right? Oh absolutely. If he has any brains he does. Sure. But the point is that it can be foreclosed upon more quickly. The the land contract is no great uh hazard to you. Yes. It, it would be for him. He would be very foolish to do that under a land contract. Yeah. Suppose you got in trouble. Mm -hmm. There is a possibility of a creditor stepping in front of him. Particularly the IRS, as an example. So. Well, but you say you're not going to, and I don't. I don't think you are. But you, you see where I'm coming from? Yes. But by all means, just do this. Trust me in this one. Have the whole thing from the option, because we didn't get into that. What happens if he doesn't perform? Does he get part of his money back? Is the twenty five hundred credited toward the price? All those things have to be decided upon. Yeah. Get it all done by an attorney of your choice that you pay. Okay. Good luck, guy. Thank you very much, sir. All righty. And you're pushing a little more snow around up here in Traverse City. Nice time of the year in the summertime. Meridian, Idaho. Hello there. Hello. I have a question. I never would have guessed. <laughs> well, I've heard people call you about collector's items. Yes. I have a Spiro Agnew watch. <laughs> Spiro Agnew. Well, there's a hot item. And I don't know. Some lady at the mall, at our local mall, told me it was worth 5000 Well, the lady is smoking her own kind of cigarettes. Where would I go to find out oh, what there, it was? There, any, you go to the library there. Mag I don't think you have any value there at all. Just talk about Okay. In my opinion, maybe I'm wrong. Election memorabilia has a value, but not a whole bunch. And then Spiro Agnew was a relatively recent... Uh, member of the scene and I just don't see where the, there'd be that kind of but where did she get that idea I don't know well I think she's dead we were now. talking about this she's got the Clinton watch <laughs> that's not worth anything either no she was she was selling those and I said, the Why backward watch yeah yeah no this is the mixed up numbers okay so they're they're a recent I don't know of any recent um, election memorabilia has any great value okay now if you had a mickey mouse watch from that era certainly that might be worth something yeah. and it might be worth a little bit but i don't think enough to get excited about okay i wish you well dear all right thanks i could be dead wrong and if somebody wants to correct me go ahead but i don't think that election stuff from the last 30 years is going to is going to be worth very much even with autographs yet but not without them Bay City, Michigan. Hello there. Hello. Um, I have a question. I, Sir, yes, ma'am. My daughter is a junior in high school. She played varsity tennis this year, had quite a successful year. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the season, she received a letter from a company which um, sponsors sports teams to go abroad. Mm -hmm. They take different, uh, different sports, both boys and girls. Um, for a six-day trip to Belgium in mm -hmm. August of mm -hmm. next year. Yeah. Um, we went to a parents' information meeting and received a wonderful package of, of all kinds of things that tell how credible they are and everything. And the cost, the total cost of the trip is just under $1,700. Mm -hmm. It includes their airfare, their ground transportation, their hotel, some meals. Their how long a trip? Six days. Oh, actually, you mentioned that six days, yeah. Their sanction fee, their uniforms. Um, their payment schedule is what we're concerned about. It's broken up into the possibility of paying five separate payments um, that are due between November of this year and May of next year when the final installment's due. Mm -hmm. um, what we wanted to right, do... Well, what I want you to do is take a deep breath because the clock is kind of nudging us out of here, but only temporarily. So if you'll hang on, we'll talk about it. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talk. All righty, I go back to Bay City, Michigan. A lady is, uh, has a talented daughter, apparently. She's a tennis type. Going to go out there and make you know, a <coughs> mighty mo of the world or however. Um, 
I guess it's some. It, it essentially it's kind of a. Is it like a tennis, almost a tennis traveling tennis camp where? It's a tennis team. They'll play. Um, different. Yeah. Well, okay. But okay. It, what we're concerned about is their payment schedule. Well, well, let's back up a little bit. Okay. Have you checked the credentials of the organization? Well, I called our local consumer protection office and our prosecutor's office in our county. They mm -hmm. called the West Florida Attorney General's office. Yeah. And said that there was nothing derogatory on file. They seem to be pretty legitimate and seem to be on the up and up. That's a start, but that's not an end. How about the yes for a bank reference? No. Well, I'd certainly do that, and I wouldn't make the call. Do you have a good banking connection in where are you calling from? Bay, Bay City. City. Do you have a, do you have a good con a banking connection there? Yes. And and get a bank reference and have your banker call their banker. Okay. All right. Now. Also, wait. Whoa, slow down. Okay. Also. I would. I have to assume that people that do this kind of stuff are at least some of them are tied up in education somewhere. Aren't there some teachers in here someplace? Well, in the in the packet of information, they included uh, references mm -hmm. of coaches that have taken teams before, mm -hmm. and I've not contacted any of them. Well, you kind of expect the references, by and large, are <laughs> are going to be favorable. They wouldn't use them as references. Well, I that's think. what we figured. I think we can. But on the other side of that, still, it is not going to hurt. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I I noticed you're talking about the finances, but I'd be a little more my daughter for the time being. In what way are you speaking? You got a sixteen-year-old kid. You're sending off with strangers. I want to know a lot about them personally. I'm not. I'd be more worried, concerned about that than I would about 